morning, everybody. I hope you all had breakfast, so I don't have to take it home. <laughs> but it's, uh, as Robin said, it's uh, really good to see real human beings. I had almost forgotten how to hand out business cards. Some of the people I met was wondering, I'm fumbling, it wasn't the alcohol, it was just not having done it for so long, but we are so happy to have uh, more or less a full house today. Um, we obviously welcome the online audience and we are really happy to have you all here today. Uh, the team has worked quite hard to put it together. As you can see, we have uh, our colleagues in from our London office and they will play a more meaningful role through the day in moderating sessions and obviously taking us through an exciting day. Uh, I was asked to speak for a few minutes. Uh, a management consultant never says no. <laughs> so you're gonna get a few minutes of uh, wisdom from me. Uh, I'm not gonna throw any numbers because all the numbers are gonna be coming from the uh, more qualified uh, panelists and moderators. So I'm gonna operate at maybe a level, one level above that from, from a strategic context, shall I say, right? So I think we'll just take it from there and then we'll move forward. So I guess the first thing is that, uh, and I'm sure all of us recognize that we're in, in an industrial revolution 2.0, right? This is uh, uh, the good side of what COVID has done. There's obviously been a big bad side. And I especially feel like I can recognize this because when I was a young consultant in Chicago in the mid 80s, 1985 to be exact, uh, the US telecom markets deregulated and I know what wonders it did to US industry. And if you go back to the early 90s in India with the launch of wireless, uh, you saw the same impact. Uh, and we also know that without those two revolutions, uh, digital couldn't exist today, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the telecom backbone that is making it happen. So I think we are at a very momentous part of history uh, for our generations and maybe the generation below me to be part of you know what is truly a global revolution in the way uh, we, we interact and the way we live and the way we transact, right? Um, and it's the, the, the good thing about it is that it's not unique to one geography. You know, in, in most revolutions, it's in one country, one place for a period of time, and then it maybe moves on. Uh, in this particular situation, you know, it's across all countries, it's all across all industries, it's across all customer segments, I mean, my mother who's 85 uh, refuses to spend time with me because she has an online bridge game <laughs> that she doesn't want to miss. Um, and you know, this is a person who I never thought could be digital ready, so to speak, right? So it's, it's hit all demographic, psychographic segments, uh, all income segments, um, low and high value transactions, and it's cross-border. So it really can't be better than this, right? Uh, and lastly, uh, you can transact digitally, whether you uh, deposit or you borrow um, in various categories, right? But the moment people bank digitally and they trust telemedicine, in my view, the final psychological barriers have been crossed. Um, so it's just, I think just, I think it's just a phenomenal uh, place that we are in. Uh, we've obviously benefited from, as I said, the pandemic, uh, the so-called silver lining to a very big cloud. Um, so we're really, I think, at, the, at a, a new point of, of history, right? Um, and it's not just a new point of history, it's also a tsunami in my view. Right? Uh, there's obviously a tsunami of transaction volumes, and you can see that in the numbers that are gonna come today. It's a tsunami of players uh, and promoters, some good, some bad. Obviously we have the CEO of one of the firms today that has been in the press recently. Um, it's a tsunami of money, uh, 
value, valuations, uh, you know, term sheets are being thrown around like uh, scrap paper in some respects. Uh, and it's obviously a tsunami of innovation. I mean, Rajesh will talk about today the innovation his firm is doing, but for all practical purposes, the level of innovation that is happening in this sector is, is mind-boggling, right? Uh, I mean, the other sector, obviously, is electric vehicles, which I never expected to actually get to where it is today as an auto industry, right? But this is leading, right? So, and then finally, I think the good news is that India is leading the world on this. Uh, and so, you know, somehow, uh, as a country, we find either accidentally or by plan uh, our uh, moments in history or in business. Uh, I think we did really well uh, on the wireless side in the 90s. Um, both the telecom sector and the financial services sector is very, very dependent on having a great uh, regulatory runway because with the, without the right regulatory runway, you really can't operate businesses, right? Um, uh, I'm hoping that the government learned some lessons from the mess that got created post facto on the wireless side. And I think they did because for the most part, I think they've been fairly supportive. In fact, as we all know, a lot of the government welfare schemes are significantly dependent and potentially the re-election of political parties is significantly dependent on the digital runways that they depend on, right? So I think all in all, you know, it's, um, it's, really, it's really good and I'm very pleased to be part of that and I'm sure all of you are. Um, I'm hoping that the end of today you all feel like uh, you gained, uh, you had a good experience. Uh, we are all from the IBSI, IBSI team here to here to look after you and help, so please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm very proud of IBSI. Uh, I don't want to use this forum to brag about it, but you know, uh, we are the leading pure play fintech research company. We've been around for 20 years. Uh, when I bought the company in 2015 in the UK, uh, at that time, the fintech revolution was just starting. It was more the bank techs of the world, you know, the Temenoses and the Oracles and the Infosys and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I'm so pleased that, at least from our standpoint, the, our customer base has grown 5x because all the baby fintechs have all become sort of big boys, right? Uh, and many uh, continue to come, right? So we're happy to be part of this journey as, as a firm, yeah. Um, I think with that introduction, um, uh, I'm going to then move along and request uh, Rajesh, who's the CEO uh, uh, of Kia. And he it was interesting, he just, when we were talking to Ray, I asked him what was the uh, background behind the rebranding and the name. And it was a very simple but interesting story, and I, I won't use it. Uh, maybe it's part of Rajesh's speech today, but um, I'm happy to welcome Rajesh. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry? Okay, come. Oh, it's Nikhil is next. Okay, sorry. We'll let Rajesh follow. Let's, uh, Nikhil, Gokhale. Nikhil heads research at, uh, at IBS Intelligence. And uh, he, he's going to show some numbers, right? Okay, thanks. Warm welcome. Thank you all for joining here. Uh, feels really, really good to be uh, in a live event where you know, we can see people face to face, shake hands, exchange cards. So, what uh, we're uh, going to do today, you know, uh, my build is to talk about the uh, payments and lending overview. Uh, what I would you know want to achieve at the end of 30 minutes is really you know. You know, at the end of 30 minutes, hopefully you will know as to why payments and lending, why we're having a conference on payments and lending, right? Why is it so important? Why is it such a hot topic? Uh, why we're talking about payments 
and lending, right? Uh, it could have been a payments conference and a lending conference, but why we have a payments and lending conference in one, one, one go, right? Uh, so, you know, with that, and, you know, of course, you know, through my presentation, you will hopefully know more about, uh, you know, why are the topics that we selected, uh, why are they important, right? Uh, so again, you know, let me, you know, uh, just talk about what, you know, what we're going to cover today, right? So, uh, you know, in the next 30 minutes, as I said, uh, we want to really understand the, the payments market in India. We will then look at what kind of lending opportunity you have uh, right now in India and why are we talking about it so much. Uh, we'll cover a little bit about the, you know, the blurring of uh, pay techs and fintechs and, and lend techs, if I could use those words, right? And then, of course, we want to leave you with some thoughts uh, of what IBS, I think, is going to happen, could happen in the future. There you go. Thank you. All right. So let's get started. So this is this is what we'll cover today. Uh, as as a firm, uh, we have more than 800 uh, pages of research in our you know in our uh, agenda in our in our portfolio. We cover more than 60 uh, companies in the payments and lending space, and we're really talking about very detailed information that we have for each of these vendors. Uh, it's the 21st year of the sales league table, uh, the iconic sales league table where we rank the top uh, vendors. Uh, 5,000 plus deals captured in vendor sales vision and you know more than 400 thought leadership pieces and articles across all the, uh, all the offerings that IBSI has. And this is a selection of you know, the, the, the companies that we cover uh, of course, there are a lot of companies, you know, the, you know broad companies uh, which have, uh, you, know, you know, offerings across the financial services industry, and also very specific niche companies in the payments field, in the lending field. So, I would say we have uh, everything covered. All right, let's jump in. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, starting off with the global payments industry, you know, it's it's something that is growing at a, a very uh, significant speed. We've seen a doubling of uh, the the transaction value in just five years. Uh, India is at 250 billion uh, out of you know could be at uh, 250 billion out of the 14 trillion, which is about two percent. Uh, doesn't sound much, I know. It's I would say it's it's a glass half full. It's a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, a good thing because you know there's a lot of room to grow, and of course I'll speak about it uh, in a bit. Uh, we we seeing the you know the whole uh, the payments uh, industry growing rapidly across all geographies. So the chart on the right, I know it's small, uh, but you know it's growing significantly across all the geographies, and you know the the, the bullet at the at the bottom right, it's 64 percent is driven by digital commerce. So you know something that is obviously uh, you know slated to grow as we as we go forward right so uh, looking at the timeline you know the uh, the 2016 when the demonetization happened uh, for everything that was written and said about the the positives and the negatives of demonetization one thing that definitely happened was the adoption of digital i think that was kind of an inflection point for the digital payments industry as a whole, all of a sudden everybody wanted to be uh, on the bandwagon. Everybody wanted to, uh, you know, pay digitally. You know, I remember, you know, I took my first baby steps then, you know, jumping out of. The, so I would, I would do NFT transfers, but you know, still using a digital wallet was new for me. So started off there. Uh, I think going, you know, if, if you know, Sanjeev mentioned about. How the telecom revolution help? I think closer to the 2018, 2019 is when you know, you know we had more players come in, Reliance Geo come in, and just just exploded the way uh, all of us actually consumed uh, consumed the internet. Uh, 2020, uh, 2020, when again COVID happened, again a big inflection point for uh, you know for the digital commerce to happen. Everybody started going online. Every Everything started going online, right? Uh, and that helped the digital payments industry. Uh, 2020 come, uh, we have 
new uh, drivers, if I will, if I may. Uh, we have BNPL there, we have cryptocurrency, we could have digital currencies. So lots of exciting things happening. And of course, not to forget, you know, all this was possible because we had things that we had in the past, right? So it didn't come overnight. We had, you know, the, in the formation of MPCI in 20, 2008, uh, and, and that actually has built on, right? and that has allowed us to actually have a strong uh, foundation in things like uh, the UPI, uh, the NEFT, and all of that. So I think the whole journey, if you take it into perspective, one thing has led to the other, and that's where we are right now in a very strong place. Again, talking about numbers, uh, as, uh, as Sanjeev mentioned, right? Uh, just in the past five years, we have grown 2x in terms of value of digital payments in India, and six times in terms of the number of transactions, right? So if you, if you actually look at the bullet below, right? 70% uh, of the transactions now happen on UPI, and it took four years for uh, for UPI trans or the you know the tra digital transactions uh, value to cross three million uh, mark, and after that, within one year, we went to seven seven lakh crore, seven trillion. Right, so a huge achievement. You can you know you can stress from the numbers, you can see the kind of adoption that we are seeing in the market in the past uh, you know, in the past three four years, but even more accelerated in the past one year or so. Uh, and the good news is there's room to grow. You know, I love this graphic. There's this rockets waiting to just start it. You can still see the rocket, and you know, maybe in a year or two, the rocket will disappear from the, the slide and will reach the space, right? The reason why I say there is room to grow, if you see the chart on the right, right? Uh, the digital payment transaction value as a percentage of GDP stands at 4%. And if you look at the other countries, which I would say are comparable, you know, in, in the same, same range in terms of uh, developing and, you know, the kind of technology, they are way ahead. And that's just, it's in simple terms, there is a lot of headroom to grow. And I think that is what, uh, you know, what we are really here for, right? This is why the reason why, why we are here. And you know, again, a large portion of population in India still remains underbanked, unbanked, and the potential is you know out there for everyone to tap into. Uh, what are the trends, right? What are the trends that will uh, uh, will help the uh, you know the, the growth, right? Of course, the everyone knows uh, businesses are moving online. You know, the traditional businesses, of course, uh, are you know were slower to go. But I think even groceries and everything is starting to go online. Even niche niche services. You know, I, you know, when we were doing the research, even things like you know pet grooming and everything is online. Right? Is you know, if you don't have an online presence, you probably don't exist. That's that's the reality of the new world. Right? And who knows? You know, you know, uh, in a few years from now, it could be a metaverse. That could be the next frontier. Right? Um, of course, we you know from a uh, Technology standpoint, we're also seeing UPI light. So even if you don't have uh, internet connectivity or you know good internet connectivity, you can still do it. Contactless transactions, wearables. Again, all these are convenience factors that once you get used to, you're never going to go back. That's the beauty of these uh, these services. And finally, digital currencies. I think that's something that you know. It's, it's something that no one has really managed to figure out, but as a country, you know, Nigeria has gone live with e-Naira, and India is uh, wanting to slate it to go live with its digital currency in 2023. Could be a game changer. Uh, you know, maybe you know, in, in the sessions ahead, uh, we, could, we could have uh, speakers talking about it. It could be a game changer. Imagine, you know, we, you know, we having you know, paying through digital currency, and we have an account with RBI. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen, right? But yeah, that could be the future. Very well, be the future uh, of payments, right? Talking about numbers, you know, uh, Sanjeev again alluded to uh, so much money flowing into the uh, the whole industry, and just the top line there, right? It's payment startups. They secured 2.6 billion in funding in 2021. That's a huge number, 
that's that's like a you know that's something that is that's you can just say uh, the the kind of opportunity that everyone around is seeing in the industry and wants to be a part of right and of course you know lots of you know names that we know some of the names we may not know so a lot of these startups are in the you know in the field disrupting the way we do payments okay moving to the the second bit which is the lending opportunity in india right now this again talking about numbers first right this is going to be a 71 trillion uh, opportunity by 2025 growing 2x in the past four years and expected to again grow 2x uh, close to 2x in the next four years a huge opportunity there you know you know home loans are going to be something that will drive it as well continue to drive it uh, but you know there's a sharp rise in the micro loans the digital micro loans that that are getting uh, that are getting approved uh, that you know more and more people are eligible for such kind of loans uh, and of course the technology doesn't stop there you know we have paperless onboarding auto approval everything instant happening and it's possible thanks to all the the right regulations coming at the right time um, and yeah the opportunity is huge uh, want to talk about the long term factors that are supporting this opportunity right you know bill gates once said that you know we as as uh, as professionals we tend to uh, over imagine uh, the changes that are going to happen in the short term but it's the long term trends that are really going to drive and these are the long term factors that are going to support the lending story come what may you know it could grow here or there print 10 percent here or there but these are structural stories that will help the lending growth right Let's, you know, i'm going to spend a few minutes on this one so you know we still have a relatively you know low uh, credit to gdp ratio right just tells you that you know you know there is again a lot of headroom to grow we are at 22 percent uh, whereas other countries UK is at 90%, 79% for US, and even China is at 62%, a very comparable geography, right? So just if you look at the number, clearly, you know, there's a, there's a growth of 40% that's just waiting to happen in, you know, in the next few years once we have all the, all the right things in place. Uh, second, you know, the, the growing GDP of uh, per capita GDP of uh, India is one of, among one of the highest across the globe and we've seen a very strong correlation between per capita GDP and you know the ability and willingness to take credit right and simply that stat tells me that there's going to be a off taking credit going ahead I think uh, demographic profile I don't need to talk much about it our dear Prime Minister is been talking about it for you know for the past uh, few years and I think you know this probably could be the last decade where, where we have the benefits of the demographic dividend, as so to say. But you know, people are more confident. People are more confident about uh, you know the way they can earn, the way they can repay, and they're more willing to take loans, right? So that demographic profile is going to help the long-term structural growth for the for the lending uh, industry. Uh, financial inclusion again, uh, we've gone from you know just in the uh, four years from 2014 to 17 we've gone from 53 to 80 percent of of people having bank accounts and in the past four years that particular number is actually starting to not just grow but not just grow in banking accounts but across different financial services right so now people are more educated in terms of you know what kind of avenues uh, they can uh, they have to turn to when it comes to lending uh, and, and they cannot get, you know, they cannot get fleeced, so to say, right? So that's, that's getting, that, that's again a very important factor. Uh, the psychological shift in behavior, I want to, again, uh, when I look at myself, uh, when I look at my parents, look at me and the, the, way, the way I interact with, with my junior team members, right? It's a completely different way of thinking. My parents would be, you know, you should be, should be living within your means. And you, should, you shouldn't be taking loans and, you know, doing things. Maybe you can take a home loan at max, right, but nothing beyond. 
for me, I think I, I think I can take personal loans once here and there. I of course use credit card, do some uh, revolving on the credit cards, but that's about it. But the the generation from here on, right? It's it, they want instant gratification, and it's not a bad thing. You know, let's not put instant gratification as a bad thing. They want it now. They they are willing to take loans for for lifestyle, for education, for travel. Their willingness is there. One because they feel confident that they will be able to earn, they will be able to repay going forward. And that confidence is allowing them to earn. I think the other thing is also uh, the lending rates. You know, I was just speaking to a few of the delegates here. And, you know, uh, the lending rates could have been 5% per month. That's, that's insane, right? And that kind of lending rates, again, contributed to the, f the fact that our parents would say, don't take loans. But now the, the interest rates are more meaningful, you know, closer to the 20s to 30s. So again, that's also contributing to willingness to take loans. And of course, finally, you know, India is digitizing. And I think I put those three dots and rapidly. Uh, just throwing a statistic to you, India right now has 76 crore people with uh, internet and that's slated to grow to 100 crores in the next uh, five years. Which means, you know, I think literally everyone will be able to access internet somehow or the other. Uh, Aadhaar cards, again, a very silent revolution that is also helping uh, lending. That, that revolution is, uh, that again, numbered for you, uh, Aadhaar card, 129 crore Aadhaar cards issued, which means, you know, we, we're there, you know, out of 140 crores, 129 crore people have Aadhaar card. So we have mapped India, right? These, all these silent revolutions that are happening uh, are the ones that are going to, you know, support the lending growth story. Uh, as I said, you know, maybe it will be 5% here or there, but that story is going to remain intact in the coming years thanks to these strong structural factors that we have uh, in India right now. And where are the where are the growth pockets, right? If you, if you if you think about it for a moment, uh, the growth pockets are going to come from the underbanked. Currently, people who are underbanked and unbanked, simply you know you cannot have branches everywhere in every every city, every village of India. But that's where the growth is going to come from. So if you look at the numbers again, uh, the the percentage of secured versus unsecured loans that's been growing in the past few years, expected to grow even faster. The bottom left uh, chart there talks about you know how the, uh, the the lending is happening more and more in the smaller cities. So you know you see the small box there, growing from 44 to 46. I know it's just a two percentage increase, but bear in mind that you know, there is rapid urbanization happening. So you know people are moving to cities, yet the uh, the growth of lending is you know higher in the villages. So. That, that number is, you know, that number is going to be significant. On the right side, it's going to be MSME loans, uh, the small merchants who otherwise, you know, they may not have enough data to put up, you know, not enough collateral to put up, and that's where the uh, lending is going to happening. Uh, that's, that's where the lending is going to happen. And finally, the person, personal loans, and the BNPL, of course, is going to be one of the major driving factors, again, I hope that you know we, you will learn more about it uh, as we go through the day. Um, but yeah, BNPL is going to be one of the biggest uh, ways that people are going to consume personal loans, slated to grow six six times. It's, it's not six percent KKR; it's six times. That's the kind of number that we're talking about. And of course, you cannot do it through the traditional ways. You, know, you cannot penetrate into these pockets, the growth pockets through the traditional ways of having a branch everywhere, every city. No, you just can't do it, right? Just, you know, simply from a point of view of economics, it won't work. And that's where the digital lending comes in. That's where the alternate data comes in. You know, today it's not just about your civil score. Uh, it's about so many other things. It's about, you know, if, if, you, if you can buy now, pay later on, let's say a flip card, they will start off with a 2,000 rupee BNPL, and then you have a better, better repayment history. They will increase it to you know values of 20,000, 25,000, and these are the places where the loans are going to happen. This is where how BNPL comes into picture. Of course, there is lots and lots of other data. Even if you look at 
uh, things like the GST filings, you know, there's a, that's kind of alternate data that companies have access to now, right? You know, you have mobile data, travel data, utility bill data, all of this data earlier, you know, you would say this data was there earlier as well, but the way you could consume it or the way financial institutions could consume it was not there, that link was missing. But thanks to the digital revolution, what's happening is that link is coming there are more players who can actually, you know, come in and help in the value chain, right? Uh, that's making it more economical, more feasible, more viable. Uh, and if you see on the right hand side, you, you know, technology is also driving down costs. It's driving down costs across the board, right from acquisition to collection, right? And again, it's making everything feasible. You, you don't need to lend at 30, 40, 50 percent, you can now actually lend at 20 percent. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the yield, that's been going down, uh, the, the difference that uh, you need to charge, that's been going down by 50 to one, uh, 120 basis points right now already, right? And the digital revolution is yet to happen. So you can expect the, you know, the, the yields to, you know, or the interest rates to actually go down thanks to competition, thanks to all the uh, operational excellence that we are we are, we are experiencing, right? Uh, again, again, numbers, you know, big numbers here as well. Uh, we had uh, lending startups getting close to a billion dollars, right? So a lot of people, a lot uh, can see the, uh, the, the story here, and they are interested in being part of the story. Okay, now the reason why we have the payments and lending together, right? Now, if you think about it, again, you know, uh, the, the MDRs or the merchant discount rates, thanks to UPI, have started going down. And the, all the payment companies that, you know, earlier could only depend on payment revenues, they have to find new ways of, uh, you know, generating revenue. And I think that's where uh, the data that they have, right? The data, all the payment data that they have, that's, that's what they're trying to monetize. Right. They have data about who is buying how much. They have data about which, uh, which merchant is able to sell how much. Uh, you know, simple things like, you know, if you go to Amazon, you know that as, as a buyer, I'm tempted to purchase from someone who has a rating of four and higher. That's again alternate data that the merchants can use, uh, that, that, the, that the payment companies can use for giving out loans to merchants. And you will see all the large uh, pay techs, if I may call them, are starting to become lend techs. They have big aspirations to lend, uh, which is good news for the customer, which is good news for the Indian rural customer, if you will. Uh, Paytm has big plans, Bharat Pay, Amazon, Phone Pay, Google Pay, name anyone, and they want to be in that space. Uh, the good news is that, you know, there is, there is enough and more room to grow, right? Uh, and, you know, from a banking and NBFC side, uh, they have, you know, three really good friends, if I may call them. It's the consumer trust that they already built. It's the cost of funds, which is obviously lower than the, uh, the pay techs have or the lend techs have, and the regulations. I think these are the three friends that uh, they have. And the best way forward is to collaborate, right? It's the best way for banks and NBFCs to collaborate with fintechs. Uh, fintechs have the data, have the innovation uh, with them, and you know, banks and NBFCs have the customer trust, cost of funds, regulation. So coming together, I think you know, lots of examples already happening, and you know, should happen, would happen, and definitely going forward will become a big part. Some ways to deepen the collaboration strategies. I'm going to jump over because, you know, someone uh, from back there is signaling the time is up. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, ways for, you know, banks and uh, NBFCs to collaborate uh, in a much deeper manner uh, with fintechs. And of course, what to look out for in the future, right? Uh, I know there are 10 uh, take key takeaways that we see from IBSI as to could be happening. If I take, you know, if I, even if I spend 30 seconds each, it will be five minutes. So I will not spend so much time on each one of them. But again, most of them are, to be honest, uh, self-explanatory, if you will. I think the whole, you know, shift that has happened thanks to COVID, uh, 
I would say that is irreversible. That's not going to go back. We are not going to roll back that digitization. The acceleration is happening. The open finance is happening. People are, want to connect with each other. They want to collaborate. Regulations are there. Uh, you have at the bottom, you have the NBFCs coming in, uh, the fintechs coming in. That's going to become bigger and bigger phenomenon. I think, you know, going forward, if you, if you think about it, I'm sure uh, there will be some kind of a umbrella organization regulatory side for lending. Uh, we have uh, the National Payments Corporation, something similar, right, with, with the boom in the lending market. Uh, digital currency, I think that's going to be, uh, who knows what's going to happen out there. Uh, fraud management, very important going forward to make sure that when we are going into the small ticket size loans, want to make sure you're able to, you know, choose the right, uh, the right loans. And finally, you know, follow the customer. Uh, foray into metaverse, possible, not possible. Maybe we will, you know, find out later today. Uh, but yeah, that's that's me. That's what uh, that's hopefully you know you know gives you a perspective of why we are doing the payments and lending conference. Why is that such a hot topic? And uh, you know, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Tim. Oh, to Robin. Thank you. It is now time for our keynote speaker, who, interestingly, follows directly on from the last point Nikhil was going to make, or was making, I should say. So joining us from the future and from the metaverse is the chief executive of Kia.ai, Rajesh Majanka. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, IBS, for this opportunity. And it's a pleasure to really ha be in front of, uh, as Robin put it, people in person. Uh, I decided that I'll deliver this keynote address without a PowerPoint, because I think what's happened during COVID times is we've seen a lot of that on Teams and Zoom. <laughs> what we've not seen is people in person, so I thought maybe the story that I want to narrate is best delivered in 3D. And of course, 3D is, again, very synonymous with what I'm going to speak about as part of my keynote, which is the metaverse, to realize things in three dimension. But let me start the story with the Kia.ai part. You know, why Kia.ai? Uh, the important aspect of that was to look at reinventing what we were providing to banks. We are a company that has been in banking for, uh, banking solutions rather, for 26 years and more. Uh, operations in 56 countries, 560 clients plus, and uh, gladly being on the IBS sales league in the leadership position in quite a few solutions. And this together brings the responsibility of innovating constantly. In that innovation, one of the th key things we've looked at is what has driven innovation has typically been the technology that is in the hands of customers. You know, it took a long time, for example, for someone to have calls being done from exchanges where I, at least I can say that I'm old enough to say that I have observed telephone calls being done by somebody putting in notes into the telephone exchange of a three-digit number, and it would connect me to an international call uh, or a local call. And then if I had a lightning call, it had to disconnect somebody else's ongoing call and then put minus the lightning call. And of course, we paid a fortune for that. And things have changed from then on to now everybody being connected to anyone just using the power of technology. But what change came up is the advent of these smartphones. The advent of smartphones bring, uh, brought across the aspect of apps and then messenger apps, etc., that then gave the ability to communicate in text, voice, and uh, video as well. So when we look at that change that's happening, it is imperative that the next technology change that comes in devices is obviously going to drive the future of how finance is done as well, and not just communications in the future. So let me just string uh, the story together to say what Kia.ai is serving. While we were in Microsoft, we delivered solutions to banks globally, and the need to reinvent it was the aspect that we realized that 
artificial intelligence needs to come in to harness the amount of rich data that is there in banks today. If you look at what has triggered India as one of the sandboxes for innovation has been the fact that we today have a very robust payment ecosystem. A lot, of, a, lot of said, a lot is said about the fact that we are having so many unicorns come in day by day in lending, in payments, etc. But if you look at the core to that is the strong ecosystem given by uh, RBI and then, of course, especially NPCI, who have come out with innovations in, uh, such as UPI, etc. That have then driven the ability to deliver seamless transactions to customers and then that to derive into products such as lending. Now, one of the things we looked at in terms of the changes that have happened is that banks that sat across for decades and had their own data and their own customers are now today seeing new technology companies come in and say that they can suddenly become unicorns. If you look at the IPO figures of banks today, they are struggling to get to the unicorn numbers, at least quite a few of them, compared to what the institutions that have come recently have done. And if you see what demarcates them, the difference is technology. That there is some awesome technology that the startups have that is able to deliver seamless transactions and, for example, lending in a second, uh, being able to conduct transactions much more seamlessly. And typically it is where the customers win. So the Kia.ai story was all about saying how do we make customers win with the solutions at the banks that we serve. So we looked at bringing in artificial intelligence to harness the pool of data that is there. And let me just tell you what is our concept of data analysis. It's the same difference between a two-dimensional report today that is in the so-called data warehouse and then brought up on the desktop. It is like looking for cinnamon as it, see, as it is seen. So you pick up cinnamon and say, okay, I can see cinnamon here. So that cinnamon either, either is my opportunity or my risk or it is what I wanted to see. But what you ha have as a need for taking decisions on the fly is to smell cinnamon and not look for physically how it looks. And that is what advanced data analytics will provide. Artificial intelligence increases the aspect of, I would say, some haptic sense in people to say that that data that has that is there residing in hard disks for a long time is able to come to life and then give out these senses and that sense of the smell of cinnamon, so to say. So that is one important aspect that drove our need to have innovation in Kia.ai, where we said that we will build what we call as bank brain. And bank brain will collate data from multiple sources, create those inferences, these KPIs, the KRIs, and importantly then have the harnessing of those with artificial intelligence to provide better customer service and efficient operations for banks. As we moved on, uh, uh, we looked at re-architecting the core systems to a microservices architecture because when you see the adoption of cloud, it is imminent, it has happened for email servers, it has happened very well for a lot of origination of customers, but you don't find banks uh, who have moved their core systems onto the cloud as much, and that is something that is bound to happen. The reason being that the people who have been on the cloud are able to deliver services ubiquitously and seamlessly across faster. So this change will then invite the need for re-architecting core solutions. And uh, I, for one, who ha we have about 300 plus core banking sites, and by saying that, you know, we've changed to Kia.ai, I'm not expecting all 300 to migrate to that platform suddenly. Because I just saw that, you know, I heard one of the banks that faced uh, a few downtimes, one of the large private banks, and the um, head of the company said, in these three years, we probably missed the opportunity to, to revamp our core banking or take it to the level what is required for this huge payment tsunami that is in. And that sort of has got us thinking to say, this is going to happen. So there is going to be a change in core to be able to then compete with the likes of the startups that are able to drive decision making faster. Then you have the ongoing regulatory change. And um, I have to just add a point of a sales picture to say, yes, we are on the top of the IBS sales league for RegTech solutions. And 
There we've seen regulatory changes happening right from just mere SDN scan list of names to transaction scanning to peer analysis. And now, if you see the mandate of how it has changed, from the aspect of what the regulation said as perception of the risk officer, it is now really the responsibility of the board to, of the bank to ensure that they are compliant. So uh, risk management has now taken a much higher step in terms of its importance in the way financial institutions are governed. That is where, again, artificial intelligence is used a lot. And if you see the need now with the whole aspect of huge amount of digital transactions, the aspect of having a four-eye view on transactions to say I will detect fraud is gone. I think gone are those days of having a four-eye view on anything in the bank now. If somebody is looking at a screen in the bank and trying to find an uh, opportunity or a issue, I think they are actually pretending to work. What actually happens is that information has to come out. You have to cull out information through analysis to be able to now take decisions. And there is no four-eye view that can happen with a 2D screen. So that has been a major change in the way regulations are looked at, where we look at fraud management as an important pillar to the whole aspect of approaching growth and customer service. So again here, uh, Kia looked at saying, bring in artificial intelligence to drive that change. Now, when we get to the last aspect of customer services, this is where the real change came in. Uh, in India, we've had the whole advent of uh, uh, the need for innovation coming from where I would see it started with demonetization and really give the trigger for people to think that, you know, we've got to have a digital payment system. And from then on, that stimulus has driven changes. And uh, quite amazingly from NPCI with UPI coming in and Aadhaar as well as one of the pillars of, I would say, uh, not just identification but innovation in the country. That has changed the way today we have financial services in India. Whether it is customer onboarding, whether it is lending, whether it is the whole part of getting Greek KYC done and being able to identify customers for uh, direct benefit to be done. It's across the span that this change has happened. So to adopt this change uh, in the way payments happened, uh, either as direct benefits or uh, otherwise, we looked at saying what has to change in the payment landscape. One of the important changes there was saying who talks to whom for a payment. So the time was you had a person talking to a person, you had a card talking to a machine, but again with the person involved because you had to enter the PIN, that changed to mobile. So you had the mobile talking to the person, and now you have the mobile talking to the machine, and very soon you'll have the machine talking to the machine, which if you see, has already started with the huge growth in proximity transactions. The growth in proximity transactions is said to be that by 2023-24, you'll have 1.3 billion people now using proximity transactions, which means the so-called QR codes and uh, apps that we run for the way UPI is seen classically would also have to adopt. And that is where I think uh, with NPCI launching UPI Lite and the ability to take UPI offline is an amazing achievement. It's a good innovation to then carry that forward. Now, coming to an important missing element within the whole banking revolution, to, so to say, has been the fact that there are trillions of dollars that have been gone from wallets to wallets in the whole age of cryptocurrency. And if all of you have noticed, that's an opportunity lost or missed by banks by not being able to be a part of that ecosystem. There are so many who have written obituaries for banks with a fintech coming in, with every revolution. And I can tell you for one that we have only got more business as a company from banks uh, and there are no obituaries on that front. But if ever there was an obituary to be written, I would say that if at all banks were devoid of act economic activity, that is the time to start seeing them in the ICU and then eventually writing obituaries. So I think there is a need for the ecosystem, the banking ecosystem, but first before the banks, to start delving into the aspect of crypto and saying they become part of what is happening as a revolution. Because legal or not, there is appetite. And appetite then would become a need and need would then become innovation. Innovation then would be adopted at the very top. And that is why I would say that we need to now look at that change, which is where I eventually come to my story of the metaverse. 
that when we look at omni-channel, we've seen that it's become a omni-channel definition of saying mobile and desktop. But eventually, if you see the increase of sales in VR uh, head headsets, AR headsets, MR headsets, is increasing with the prices coming down. And increasingly, you will find people on games. And that experience, I can say, is a wow factor. The fact that, you know, um, in COVID times, you have not paid people, that people have been attracted to the so-called avatars on the games to say, okay, we've got some life going here. That is going to then come into banking. And that somewhere links my two stories of metaverse and crypto. I think uh, the initiative by the Indian government to look at CBDC as one of the fortes, as a fungible token, is quite timely to that effect. Because with CBDC coming in, I think India stands to be one of the first countries in the world having a great payment ecosystem, then bringing in CBDC to now drive that because adoption is faster. And why I say that is because the few countries that have launched CBDCs, I have been there in person, at least in this one trip that I did, I went to both the countries, the world's first uh, country to launch a CBDC and then um, the one that we're mentioning now. Without taking names, I can say that both places, the CBD is sitting in the crypto wallets because nobody is using it. Why? It's because there is no payment ecosystem. So when we look at CBDC in India, I think the time has come for that adoption. The change of what will happen in Omnichannel is the fact that an avatar being an NFT now will be certainly in demand to say get traded. Why will it happen? Look at the demand for emojis within the messaging apps, right? They've had to come with sort of 3D looking emojis. One small revolution of saying that I will have a simple NFT being issued to you on the messaging app to provide you your avatar, because I can tell you my emoji doesn't look anything like me. So when I'm just putting a smile or something like that, I can tell you, you know, I'm just trying to render an emotion, but I'm not saying that I'm doing it. That thing is going to change with a NFT coming across as an avatar. That will then drive the change to say, where do you show this NFT? The metaverse is the obvious platform for the NFT to reside. Now you have um, a challenge that you have metaverses that are coming up in out, outside of India as large companies that are coming up with their own metaverse. I do see that as a opportunity for social interactions, but as a risk for doing financial services. And why do I say that? is because we've seen with the recent geopolitical issues that certain payment providers were forced by their governments not to provide payment services. I can guarantee that, you know, all of us know that that is not likely to happen in India ever because we now have the world's best payment system. So if some private player said we don't want to operate in India, that would only be an opportunity for India to scale up further. But that's not something that will happen if Metaverse was to be then so-called outsource as an experience to private players. And that's why Kia.ai thought about coming up with Kiaverse, where we said that a bank can have its own Metaverse. Why? Is because the bank is an active community. The bank is also a marketplace. The bank can provide the NFT. The bank can also provide that experience. The bank already has assets. Those assets can become digital assets. So what more do you need as a business case to come up and say banks will need to adopt the metaverse at some point in time. So we are looking at a strategy in Kia.ai of having a metaverse for banks where their customers can have their avatars and where do these avatars come in play? Um, India recently spoke about digital banking units. So we said that's the best opportunity. The digital banking unit creates the avatar. It transits into the mobile, into a web GL interface. It transits into uh, 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 desktop as a WebGL interface like you play normal games and eventually seamlessly transits into the metaverse. Will metaverses interoperate? I definitely think so. Because if NFTs can be traded across as a common entity as, you know, non-fungible tokens with the backbone of crypto, I guess with, if NFTs were the avatar, then I'm sure the avatars can transcend across multiple metaverses for that purpose. And adopting a metaverse for a bank will provide the opportunity to not be away from the opportunity of where crypto is playing a big role 
in how transactions are conducted. You can hear today that people are buying virtual assets on some metaverses as buildings, as shops, etc. And uh, some of you may be tempted to do so. Uh, I'm sure the Barbie doll revolution brought in the fact that you had accessories of small clothes being put onto the Barbies. So that whole life to now say that you can buy clothes for your avatar also is coming through. So for all of you who missed the Barbie doll revolution, at least a person like me, and that's my last opportunity to go in and say, okay, let me now put some clothes onto my avatar and feel that Barbie feeling, get the Barbie feeling. So that is something that Metaverse provides, and I think the banks should not miss that opportunity. The fintechs should not miss that opportunity because the Generation Z is going to go on to the VR headsets, the AR headsets, and want a 3D interface as an experience. Likewise, if I were to say, how are our interactions going to happen at the banks? I would think that, you know, instead of saying that you stand in a queue, um, just imagine coming into the metaverse and becoming part of a room that is allocated for you. Meeting the avatar of your personal banker, who would then give the suggestions. Your documents are kept in a file as, again, free NFTs. Carry those with you, and you can say that these documents are now also possible to be given to somebody, like a deposit receipt. If I treat that as an NFT and say, this is my deposit receipt, and I want a loan against it, who's going to challenge that if it came as an NFT from a bank? And I think those are the various opportunities as we'll delve into. The more you think about how Metaverse can run banking and finance for the world, you'll get as many use cases. And at Kia.ai, what we've done is we've put up an experience center where we've said, come through an experience from being on a 2D mobile tile-based app to a hamburger menu on internet banking to then transiting to WebGL and then having the uh, digital banking unit with the AI-based virtual humanoid and eventually feeling your part or you being part of the humanoid inside the metaverse. And those are the interesting journeys that we are creating for uh, uh, banks and financial institutions. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think uh, we should all look forward to have the next event possibly talking about the metaverse. Thank you. It's my privilege now to introduce uh, and welcome uh, the first panel discussion, which is on the future of digital payments and the cashless economy. Uh, moderating this panel is V. Ram Kumar, senior partner, Cedar and IBS Intelligence. Ram, may I request you to join me on stage? Thank you. Uh, I would now welcome the esteemed panelist, uh, Mr. Bharat Panchal, Chief Industry Relations and Regulatory Officer, India Discover Financial Services. May I request Bharat? Uh, Mr. Gautam Narayan, Partner, Apex, Partners, LLP. Gautam. <laughs> Mr. J. A. Chaudhary, Chairman, Blockchain Committee at Bureau of India Standards, Government of India. Warm welcome, Mr. J. A. Chaudhary. Uh, Mr. Mehul Mistri, uh, Global Heads, Global Head of Strategy, Digital Financial Services and Partnerships, Vibmo, a PayU company. And uh, last but not the least, Mr. Saugata Bhattacharya, Executive Vice President and Chief Economist, uh, Axis Bank. Over to you, Ram. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, after a very interesting power pack discussion, uh, uh, overload of data that we had this morning, I guess it's, it's good to actually have some discussion around what we have been having uh, on... Uh, the digital payment space and what we see as the cashless economy as we move into the future. Uh, and I guess uh, we would be having an interesting discussion both on what the journey we have traversed so far and also the, the journey that we are about to, uh, as we saw some of the numbers that we saw this morning, uh, it's quite interesting and quite fascinating. So if I may actually maybe start uh, the discussion uh, with you, Saukada, uh, and and you actually have been an uh, economist and then talking about what we've seen as a 4% uh, as, a, as a ratio of what we see to the GDP and India is obviously now in the league that we are trying to catch up. How have you seen the journey we have traversed in the last five years on the digital payment space? And more importantly, as we move into this cashless economy, 
uh, what is your forecast? Uh, so, um, th this, this has moved uh, really significantly. I mean, uh, we, uh, in the morning, I saw a big uh, piece in the papers uh, with uh, the Ministry of uh, Electronics, mighty, mighty. Uh, so with a huge amount, 8 point uh, something uh, lakh crores, trillion rupees, uh, in, in the, with the UPI payments. Um, so I have some numbers here. Uh, in the, uh, from 2009, uh, cash uh, to retail electronic, I'm, I'm talking about retail, uh, not, not the wholesale bulk. Uh, cash to retail electronic transactions in 2009 was about 140%, 140%. Uh, in 2017, it dropped to 9%, to 2020, uh, 7%. So that, that's the change that, that has come in. Retail uh, uh, electronic transactions uh, to nominal GDP uh, was about 9%, just the mirror of this, uh, 9% in 2009, 56% in 2015, 159%, 159% in 2019, and 171, I think it's more in, in 2020. Uh, and and uh, the value of these small ticket transactions, those have increased enormously. NEFT was, is the largest payment, uh, the retail electronic payments, uh, was 1.5 uh, trillion rupees in, in uh, 20, 2012. This has gone to 19, 20 uh, trillion rupees in, in uh, 2020. Mobile banking, this is the UPI, uh, the mobile banking part, this is how uh, data is classified. Uh, 1.1 uh, trillion rupees in 2017, now about, as I said, 8.6 in, in the, uh, 2020, FY21. So this is, this is the scale at which electronic payment, retail electronic payments have increased. I mean, of course, I mean, cash still remains uh, a significant part of, of total transactions. Our, our, uh, our GDP is about $3 trillion, about uh, 200 and, uh, at the end of this year, likely about 230 trillion rupees. Uh, total cash is about 31 trillion rupees, 31 lakh crores. Uh, so cash still remains. So we were just talking about this, uh, how do we move to a cashless society. It's not going to be a cashless society, it will be a less cash uh, society. I like that. And, 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 and you know, I mean, countries, I mean, uh, Japan is still extremely cash, uh, uh, the transaction led. On the other hand, the Scandinavian economies are almost no cash in the system, so I guess we'll be somewhere, but definitely our, our infrastructure, I mean, all of you, all the experts know here, the infrastructure that we have created for payments, retail payments is world-beating, world-class, particularly the UPI, and that's been taken as a model. So sorry. Uh, speaking of Lovely. From a cashless economy, the discussion is more on less cash economy, and quite like that uh, articulation, this and I think that brings me to a very interesting um, Perspective I want to take from you here, Mehul, and you've obviously been, you're a strategist, you've actually worked with banks and building a lot of fintech partnerships over the years. And as where we are today, uh, the one question that we always see is, you know, what is actually driving this change? Is it the latent customer demand that is manifesting in the adoption that we are seeing with such vigor? Or is it actually the arrowhead of innovation that technology is bringing to the table? And I'm, I'm sure the answer is somewhere in the middle, but if you were to pick between the two, where would your priorities and what would you pick as the driver for this change? Sure. Uh, Ram, so what I would say is, uh, you know, what the customer is looking for is basically invisible payments, frictionless payments, okay? That is what customer needs. And whatever innovation that we see, okay, in the market, whether it has been done by big technology companies or a pay tech companies, they are trying to remove that friction in the system. And, uh, you know, just to uh, basically uh, put some numbers, okay, so uh, 2013, 2014 is when, you know, I was working on one startup. And the problem that I was trying to solve, not, uh, you know, it's, it's just 10 years back, is basically to say that how do I make a payment gateway experience for a large marketplace, okay, uh, seamless and frictionless for them. And what I've realized when I was trying to do a research is that, uh, 2013, 2014, 70% of the transaction on the marketplaces like Flipkart, etc., were COD, cash on delivery. Okay, I mean, it's just 10 years, right? 70% of the transaction. Today, if you log into Amazon, Flipkart, or, you know, Lenskart, etc., you don't see that option now. Okay, and most of the time, you will see UPI as, as like one of the top uh, payment option. So what the customer needs is basically a frictionless payment option, okay, whether, uh, and all the technology companies are innovating on those lines. 
and I'll give you another example. So today itself, so today morning when I got up and I realized that, you know, basically we have exhausted basically shaving cream at home, right? And, and I was like, it's only 30 minutes I have to rush for this uh, conference here. And uh, what I did is I went to Instamart and then I went, uh, you know, I was getting ready in 20 minutes, okay, the product came to my residence. Okay, and the payment happened seamlessly. I was not bothered whether I have to remove my card, etc. It just happened very seamlessly. So that is the change that has happened. And the change has happened because of various reasons, because of the technology infrastructure that has been created by the government, the policies that has been put forward by Reserve Bank, the technology infrastructure created by NPCI, all of that put together. Interesting. So you see a lot of change that has been driven with the context of what has been done over the years, particularly by NPCI and the government. And that brings me uh, to you, Mr. Chaudhary. And you know, you obviously have been, uh, you are the chairman for the Indian Blockchain uh, Association. And more importantly, you have you've been a founding director at STPI and been advisor to the governments and with many chief ministers. And you obviously have a lot of context from a governmental standpoint, right? And going back to where Mehul was indicating that a lot of the benefit that we're seeing today uh, is based on the foundation that has been laid over the years. Uh, and we see that to be continuing as well. And some of the comments we saw this morning was alluding to how and what Rajesh was talking about as we have created infrastructure today that enables us to do a lot of stuff that many other countries are waiting to do. So from that standpoint, and if I was to ask you, how has the government played a role and is playing a role uh, from where you see things in this whole journey? Thank you, Ram. <clears throat> Actually, um, if you see from the government's point of view, uh, government did not really match up to the other countries in terms of creating the physical infrastructure compared to any Western countries and all that. But when it comes to the digital infrastructure, we actually surpassed even the most modern uh, countries and uh, well-developed countries in terms of the digital infrastructure whatever you are seeing, the digital eruption in the, in the country is, uh, I don't think any country can match to what India at scale we are doing the digital eruption. I'll t uh, give you two examples. See, uh, th this uh, physical conference I'm attending after three years. So recently I wanted to uh, visit a temple uh, in uh, my native place. It's a small temple. After visiting the uh, temple, I was coming out along with my daughter and uh, son in and few beggars, they started uh, coming uh, for some uh, money. So I uh, looked at, at my purse. There were only 500 rupee notes were there. I, I told them that, uh, sorry, I don't have uh, change. One of the beggars says, sir, do you have Google Pay? <laughs> I was really stunned. A beggar having a smartphone and talking about Google Pay. That is a kind of a digital adoption that India has come. The second uh, thing which I observed uh, when I was uh, going to uh, a, a farmer's market uh, in Hyderabad along with my wife, every farmer has got uh, the QR code. Earlier, most of these uh, uh, vegetable vendors and all that, uh, this thing, they used to only accept the cash. Every, every, at every location, there was a QR code and just scan, maybe COVID uh, restrictions or whatever it is. They all adapted to the new technology of uh, receiving the money and uh, uh, getting all that this thing. This is unheard of uh, in the Indian context. Uh, in fact, I live in my village in the last three years. Earlier, most of the farmers were selling and buying in all cash transactions. Today, every farmer, they, they are using the smart mobiles and they're able to send their goods to nearby and receiving the payment digitally. So that's a kind of a, a trust in the digital uh, payment mechanism digital infrastructure happened because government of India coming from the Aadhaar, India strike, NPCI setting up, uh, creating the EPI, all this, uh, the fundamental blocks and creating the trust factor among the end consumers, not about uh, the, uh, what you call urban, urbanites and who are educated uh, people, even uneducated uh, farmers, uneducated people in the living in the rural economy, 
they are building the trust on the digital payments and digital economy that's where i mean i, I see a lot of opportunities for startup companies today in fact we have a startup fund called uh, succeed innovation fund we invested uh, nearly about 35 uh, companies in the last one and a half uh, years and many of them are in the fintech space mm. many of them in the agri tech space they are all i mean using the technology using the backbone created by government government definitely in terms of the digital infrastructure is concerned definitely we have done uh, very good uh, including the bharat net somebody was mentioning that without the network without the bandwidth you know, we can't I mean, have any meaningful uh, business transaction so uh, i can probably say that yes uh, uh, starting from stpi days to advise to mr chandrababu naidu when we were implementing the real time governance real time governance if uh, some uh, uh, farmer in a village if he has got a uh, problem earlier they used to go to near, nearby mro office then collector office and so many times they used to uh, today is not like that i mean you can simply complain that in the real time governance uh, environment that will go up to the chief minister level and they have to take immediate action otherwise uh, Uh, somebody will get a notice digital notice uh, to the officers to that extent i think we have gone digitally i think digital not only digital commerce digital governance is also pushing the digital adopt- adoption in the country and going forward i see a lot of startups uh, i was uh, discussing with some of uh, the panel members uh, today who are attending this uh, meeting the lot of unicorns are coming in the uh, fintech space and all, uh, other uh, uh, technology space and that is going to increase earlier every startup company they used to go to silicon valley because market was in silicon valley market was in other countries today the market is in india where is the market of this uh, billion uh, billion uh, people uh, people using the uh, digital ecosystem i think india is the biggest market uh, in the entire world that's the reason why you see most of the technology uh, companies coming from silicon valley they are setting up their operations in india i think that is going to grow and i am seeing a brighter uh, the new uh, what you call uh, uh, swarna yuga for india through this uh, digital economy that we have created we are able to ex- i mean uh, definitely uh, meet all the expectations of the uh, not only the global citizens or in particular the indian citizen more importantly the rural citizens i think we are able to meet the aspirations of the rural people in india through this uh, uh, bringing the level playing field whether as a poor farmer uh, in a village versus uh, urban rich this thing technology is same whether uh, I, mean, i don't think technology can differentiate between uh, a poor farmer and a rich uh, person in the urban areas that's where you see a lot of uh, uh, adaptation is going to happen and i see a lot of growth opportunities uh, particularly for the startup companies in india thank you thank you mr choudhury we i we recently we talked about unicorns and the new silicon valley is in india i'll, I'll come to you gautam and, and you see things from a perspective of an investor and and as a partner of a pe firm you see things in a very different light from what people would have seen in 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 a from a technology standpoint right so we're talking about you know we touched about 100 billion uh, last october the upi payments in and if interestingly we see the growth you know from a value standpoint at 2x but the volume standpoint at 6x uh, so you actually are seeing that in you know, the number of transactions are higher or growing faster which means lower ticket size growth is faster which means that option is higher as we spoke earlier if you were to actually look at things from what would be the success factors and potentially the challenges or impediments that one should be watching out for from where we are how would you see things yeah so you know the three things uh, we care about right if one if this sector has to prosper or access okay which the npc and the government has delivered the second is sustainability and i'll come to some of the points uh, you spoke about and the third is trust which uh, mr choudhury also uh, talked about so from our perspective you know the thing which is in question today is sustainability uh, because a lot of consumer surplus has got generated a lot of surplus has got generated at a merchant level uh, but what about the psps mm. okay the the leading listed uh, psp in india announced a quarterly loss of uh, 780 crore in december right uh, the funding is predicated on a path to profitability okay as we sit here that path has kept getting delayed 
you know, every unicorn announces one quarter of profits just before the IPO, and magically those become, you know, losses soon after the <laughs> IPO. Okay. So the way we uh, kind of see it, uh, it's very important that there be a clear path to profitability. And unfortunately, in payments, uh, today, uh, given the zero MDR, on the payment side, there is no profit to be made. So then the question is, what do these people do? Now, uh, we've literally sort of cornered them at every stage, right? From wallets, there the profit disappeared. Now data, with the democratization of data, you don't have privileged access anymore. Uh, lending, lending can be a bit, uh, you, know, uh, ephir, you know, ephemeral, right? It, it may not sort of uh, last because the risk that these people are taking is, is disproportionate to the sort of returns that are there. So it is, we are in a bit of a, you know, tight spot. I would say that's a key thing which needs to be resolved. On the other front, see, access, we are largely there. I think there is uh, some sort of incremental work to be done. Uh, you know, government is already thinking about it, you know, feature phones, uh, you know, uh, offline, all of that is already in the work. So I don't think there is uh, much, much work to be done. The th third area which uh, Mr. Chaudhary spoke about trust, you know, that again, and I'm speaking from personal experience, you know, I ordered a nice bottle of wine from one of the, uh, you know, uh, online portals. And later I found out that despite all my so-called sophistication around uh, the space, I was a victim, okay? And it was not a small amount. So, you know, with that sort of background, I've been a little jaded. So I don't know, you know, not being a tech expert myself, I don't know how the back end works, right? So it is a bit of a black box to me, and it's created a little bit of uh, inertia for going into high value payments, especially when the kind of entire journey is not very clear. So I worry about the consequences of uh, cybersecurity, uh, data ethics, uh, data security, access to data. So these are all sort of critical issues which the government is also looking at. Uh, you know, once these three aspects are resolved, I think the sector has a very bright future. Thank you. Thank you, Vadam. I think that was very fascinating also to know about what... Uh you know, we are seeing from the growth comes with a shadow of, uh, of cyber security and maybe that would take me to the question to you, Bharat, and you obviously have been, you're an expert in, um, you're architect of cyber security as uh, your profile reads and, you know, it's interesting that, you know, there was a point that is being made about uh, so much that we don't see and things sitting behind the scenes and the whole security angle, not just about personal information but also a lot of data sitting out there. As we move more and more into this digital payment space, then there is, there is a shadow of vulnerability that comes along, right? So what would you think, you know, is the, the risk? How would you view the risk that comes along? And more importantly, how do you see the regulations keeping pace with it? Thank you, Dom. <clears throat> so before I answer to your question, let me take a little back to the cashless economy, what we were discussing. Because <clears throat> Fortunately, I was part of the great digital journey of this country, being one of the top executive and uh, founding member of NPCI, led the security risk and compliance for a good nine years. Seen the growth from just 32 banks on NFS to last product as FastTech. So I have seen certain things very closely, probably may not be aware to the public. So when we are talking about, uh, you know, five billion transaction today on UPI, and, uh, you know, as what Mr. Chaudhary was talking, similar experience happened with me as well. When I, I was in Chennai last week, I went to one temple, and uh, when I, one flower uh, merchant was there, and uh, the, the people accompanied me uh, told uh, to that lady that she was having QR code, and I just asked that, okay, has it, you know, your business has grown, or is, do you see any impact? She was very, very vocal on this thing. That, yes, sir, because earlier, if person comes to buy 10 rupees flower, either they don't have a change or, you know, uh, you know I don't have a change. And because of that, they, they never used to, uh, you know, pay attention for this. Now, since because this QR code is there, they just come, do it, and, uh, you know, my, my business has gone 50 to 70%. And to my surprise, then my friend told that, okay, he's a man who was part of the design. She literally came and touched my feet. So that's a, that's a kind of proliferation what we have done. But it was a time in 2012 when we launched IMPS, we literally pushed the bank that, hey, do some transaction. We used to do internal transaction, and it was a celebration after 1,000 transactions in two weeks. 
from there to 5 billion. I think there's a phenomenal journey what we have achieved. And if I had to take you back a little more, and uh, Rajesh may be aware, in 2008 when we launched OTP, single factor, uh, second factor authentication, people laughed at it in India. That, oh, you guys don't have tele density, you don't, you don't have a remote, uh, you know, uh, last mile connectivity, how are you going to deliver it? Today, I think India has the most sophisticated at very, very safe and secure payment system because of multiple things. One, there was the great thing, probably in, in my personal experience, if I have to say, not having legacy in technology is a blessing. And I think we ride upon that. When we, we thought about, you know, all revolutionary products, be it UPI or be it IMBS or Rupe or, you know, fasting and everything. There was no scale and, uh, you know, kind of uh, design available anywhere in the world. And we ventured into explore something new. And thankfully, the, the government policies or, you know, the regulator's vision, bankers supported a lot. Because of that, all this miracle, I would say, because, you know, for me, uh, you know, a lot of blood and sweat has gone to have all this product uh, as a reality, what you all are enjoying today. But uh, in this whole journey of last 10, 12 years, Probably one good thing uh, if I have to tell you about. When it comes to risk and security, I think I was so blessed to have complete free hand from regulator, from board, from my management, that anything about safety and security, no compromise. I think that has, that has really given a lot of support to when I, I talk about safe, secure, and affordable payment system, I think one key ingredient of that is about security. Because, you know, we, we all agree that safety, uh, security, and quality are something which you can't add at the icing of the topping, right? Because, you know, it's something you can't add at last layer. Thankfully, every product, security is by design, and that is what is ensured in everything. The thing is today, and coming back to, uh, you know, the answer, original answer, that what risks are there? The risk is, first, is a digital illiteracy. I think that is the fundamental issue today. Digital illiteracy because is a socio-economic system can be disturbed by greed and ignorance than the technology loophole. And that is what is my personal experience because probably the collectively kind of cyber attack and uh, fraud which I have seen, uh, maybe collectively this room also may not have seen being in NPCI, and I have seen how people have made silly mistakes. It is same in technology, it is same in you know, uses and all, but when it comes to cyberspace today, See, the, the paradigm shift in terms of uh, volume and value and product and all we are talking is fine. But there is a paradigm shift as well in the behavior of people, the availability of, you know, the system for, you know, uh, making, uh, doing banking. That is also change. You know, when it was a time where we used to stand in a queue, uh, or rather we used to take half day leave to uh, do banking, right? It is on fingertips. Where was, uh, you know, uh, Google Pay, hai, that's it. That, that's, a, that's a reality. But, you know, at the same time, the journey of technological changes or challenges arrived because of this, uh, you know, new wave of fintech. That is literally ignored. Mm. Because when banks are not the techie company, if they start competing with the technology company, then they are losing the pr primary business that is bank. They have started outsourcing. Now, the same kind of strategy, same kind of, you know, the DAP, same kind of, uh, you know, monitoring for all parameters, which is very, very important from the security aspect, who is going to monitor? That is one important uh, loophole. The second point, while uh, with all due respect to the technology partner worldwide and, and especially in India, they have made fantastic ecosystem, but there is a lacuna in terms of the regulation to regulate them. Because see, when, when there are a lot of regulation to bank, Banks are passing those regulations to the fintech, but there is no, you know, strong compliance mechanism by which you can ensure that, you know, all these regulations are uniformly across. Because, you know, one bank has at least 50, 60 different technology partners. How are we assessing that risk? Last but not least, the cybersecurity is, while we, we, we are, you know, looking in the pockets that, you know, my bank, my ATM, my customer, my branch, these are gone. I mean, uh, you know, and uh, Rajesh also mentioned about the 4i concept, all these are now obsolete. This is not, go not going to work. Collectively, you are putting all the eggs in the single basket. That's the, that's the flip side of technology. Because if something goes wrong, where in physical banking, you had watchmen, you had, you know, uh, you know uh, maker, checker, so many things. And there'll be somewhere, there'll be kill chain. 
In cyberspace, there's no kill chain unless you are very, very, you know, prompt to detect and respond to that. If that goes wrong, today morning, there is a, one of the dangerous hackers group in the world called Anonymous. They have hacked the Central Bank of Russia. They have got 45,000 import, important files in their control. Imagine that happened to one of the smallest banks here. We, have, we are fortunate we have seen Hitachi. We have seen, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the Cosmos Bank. We have seen Union Bank sweep. Those are very, very minuscule compared to what larger issue happen in, around the world. Mm. We are still immune. We are not going to be immune. We are, we are safe till the time you are not hacked. That's, that's a golden statement. So how are we going to plug those gaps? I think that's a challenge in today's time because we are at the point of no return. You can't survive without your mobile. You may get divorced with your wife, but you can't <laughs> divorce with your mobile. Right. And, and, and when, when we launched UPI, Nandan told that, oh, this is going to be WhatsApp moment for India. I think we have gone to the stage where we have forgotten WhatsApp. People are talking only UPI. Right. So that, that we, are not get, we are not going to detach from our life. We have to survive it. So it may not be wrong to say that roti kapda makan, that's the basic necessity of life. You have to put cyber security before that. Because if you do, if you do not take secret cyber security with so much of seriousness, you will have trouble to get roti kapda and makan at the end of the day. Thank you are you. safe until you're hacked. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bharat. I, I guess we will go into round two and we'll make it a little interesting. And this is one question I have for all the panelists. And we'll probably go, we'll start with you, Mr. Chaudhary. Yep. Uh, and the question is this. If you were to make one prediction or you want to state one expectation that you have for the quote-unquote cashless economy as we move forward, what would that be? Before I answer that uh, question, uh, uh, the kind of issues for cybersecurity in the digital economy. Actually, when I was with the AP government as the special chief secretary, we have a, one group, a selfless, a self-help group called Dwakra. They're all uh, woman-led uh, cooperative, uh, this thing. They, they transact a lot of businesses. And some of the uh, women uh, entrepreneurs, part of this uh, self-help group, they were hacked by some hackers and they lost a lot of money. That's when uh, Honorable Chief Minister, Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu asked us, can we do something, uh, how to create a, a secure mechanism? Then we gave, gave an uh, idea that why don't we create a digital tokens? Though uh, RBA at that time, uh, they were not uh, interested in introducing any digital currency or cri cryptocurrency, but we did not say, say crypto, say digital tokens. We issue the digital token based on some uh, standard fiat currency value and they transact among themselves with those tokens. Whenever they want to encash, I mean, uh, the gate, uh, uh, they can uh, convert that into uh, whatever the fiat. Uh, uh, so that idea was uh, liked by him. We were about to uh, uh, introduce that. In the meanwhile, government fell and... Uh, Solutions uh, evolve, as you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I see whatever uh, the problems mentioned, the security problems, it's so again a great opportunity for the startup companies. And uh, they have to fix those problems. And obviously, they, they will be in the business. So I, I see uh, that opportunity as an uh, answer to your question. Uh, we still have a lot of uh, issues to be resolved in the, even the digital space. That's a great opportunity for our entrepreneurs. So you see, your prediction is that you see um, even more entrepreneurs coming into the startup space. Absolutely. Thank you. Mehul, if I go with you, your one prediction or expectation. Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, because of the digital infrastructure which has been created by the government, okay, what I see is this open banking is something which will uh, basically scale up. So today, if you see all real-time payments, okay, whether it is IMPS, UPI, about close to 50% of the real-time payments are not happening through banking channel. Okay, so, for, and when I'm saying banking channel, so people would transact using the front end, which is not of a bank. So let's say Google Pay, Phone Pay, these are not licensed entity. But if you see in next three to five years, this 50% of the transaction which are only happening through banking channel and remaining 50% by non-banking channel, uh, about 75 to 80% will start happening from non-banking channel. So you would see a customer making payment from Zomato 
and the transaction also will get complete from Zomato. So Zomato would have like a, a third party application from a bank and the transaction will happen from there. So that is one trend which I see happening. The other piece is the point of sale terminal, the way we have seen today, right? Uh, basically, so point of sale terminal for last 10, 15 years, what has happened is that a merchant wants to collect payment. Similarly, the way a customer wanted to do a frictionless payment, the merchant also wanted to not get into that pain of taking card swiping, waiting for the receipt to come out and stuff like that. If today, if you see, at times there is a QR code at the merchant, you scan, customer can make payment to that QR code and you realize there is one box lying somewhere, okay, and that would read saying that received payment of 50 rupees, right, something like that. So the merchant is not getting disturbed from his normal other things. Payment is happening seamlessly. So what I see is from this point of sale terminal based transaction at the merchant location, lot of these transactions will happen at, on the QR code or it would combine along with the point of sale terminal. So the POS will be Android POS, okay, a QR code would get generated there and then the transaction will happen seamlessly. This is something which I see definitely happening in no next three to five years. And the traditional POS that we see right now in the market to a large extent will completely disappear in three to five years. Interesting. So it's not only less cash, it's all less POS as well. So <laughs> What would your view on your prediction or expectation be? Um, not expectations. I think the next frontier, probably the last frontier uh, in payments is cross-border. Extremely inefficient now uh, with the SWIFT system that we all hear about. Uh, so that's the next uh, part, uh, cross-border payments. I, I think uh, this is something uh, BIS, uh, the Bank of International Settlement, is running a program called Nexus. Uh, linking, they have about uh, six or seven countries now. Uh, about 60 countries now have an instant or a fast payment system. So now they are trying to, uh, uh, Bharati would know this, uh, now they're trying to link uh, the systems uh, from, from there. And, uh, and obviously the last frontier, uh, well, I mean, I'm not sure the last frontier is the digital currencies, uh, the CBDC. Central Bank Digital Currency. So nine countries now have uh, actually introduced a CBDC. Uh, India is probably one of the leading pioneers and many, many programs on the retail, wholesale, the Dunbar project, uh, the, the uh, uh, Rapier project, I, I don't remember that name, the retail uh, parts. So that's probably the one uh, that now is going to be the next move uh, from digital on to a different uh, payment model. Different so so cross-border and CBDC are your picks, yeah? So maybe I'll go with you, Bharat, next. Yep. So, okay, I'm not good at prediction, but <laughs> I live in uh, reality. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we have heard about uh, the proliferation of, uh, you know, on scale and the volume in system. But, you know, from, if I have to see from the digital currency and digital ecosystem perspective, we, we, what we are cherishing today, it is about 20% people living in India. We have yet not have that, that great moment for 80% people living in Bharat. And I think that is where the larger market. But you know, the case is very different here because you know, you and me haven't gone to learn how to use WhatsApp or Facebook and all, but my, my old age father in village, he doesn't know how to use UPI because he is, is fond of uh, having a feature phone. You have to educate that society. You have to keep them, you know, the confidence is one of the key factor, be it digital banking or physical banking, right? How are you going to gain that trust coming from that part of the, the uh, pocket of this country? That is going to be the biggest challenge. That is point number one. The second point is, you know, again, you know, we are in aggregated market. We all are talking about the great aggregator model, PA, PG, VSP, all this is. Are we not are we not becoming critical uh, or you know kind of uh, you know very uh, focal point where it can make or break, right? Because so far we are talking about the critical infrastructure only the power sector or uh, atomic or you know uh, kind of thing. Banks are also becoming critical infrastructure today, mm. and not only bank. There are fintechs. Those are hosting 100, 200, 300, 500 banks in their environment. What if something goes wrong to them? How are we going to protect them? I think, you know, when we are talking about the you know, digital currency and all, thankfully we have, it is plug and play model for us. I mean, uh, and, and very uh, nicely put by Rajesh that we have ecosystem already created. We have to just plug in. 
and it is up to people to use it. But you know, we have very you know sweet difficulty here, like you know compared to Idli Sambar versus Gujarati Thali. Payment system or option available in India today is so much so that people are really confused. They, they, you know, whether to go with phone pay Beam, or UPI or you know Google Pay or I have to go and do bill payment using BBPS. So much, so much of confusion. So probably the consolidation is one part where because you know when you know people want to do frictionless, maybe less pause, less UPI, anything that that is where the next uh, you know uh, generation will be. But from the security point of view, I believe that we, we need to really think differently about securing our transactions, securing our infrastructure. Because you know, when it comes to a sabotage, or war-like situation between what is happening between Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine our Ukrainian hackers have brought down around 2,000 websites of Russia without crossing the border. And unfortunately, all big cyber attack of this country, which I have investigated, I knew from where it happened. We couldn't go and get that guy who did from Ukraine or Lithuania or Cyprus damage our banking system. And that will be remain fact forever. How are we going to cope up with those challenges? We need to have a skilled resources, those who think out of box, just not VAPT, simple Pinterest. Because you know, we are still believing, you know, when, when it comes to security, larger, larger perception is that it is an operational risk. It is a business risk. Mm. It is a business reason and that mindset has to be changed right from the board to the last person working for the organization that it is, it can hamper your business and there is no revert from the point where you lose your credibility in, in cyberspace. I think that is where we are heading. Interesting. So it's not just digital illiteracy but cyber risk illiteracy that also has to be handled. Agreed. And, and consolidation is your prediction. Thank yes. you, Bharat. Gautam, your words. I think we started from a realm of saying less cash, then we moved to less ATM, then we moved to less cards, now we are saying less pause, <laughs> okay? I would say that going forward, less product. I think there is a scenario where there can be less banking, you know, with CBDC. So look, I think the key to me is coexisting, you know, with offline versus online, with banking versus cards versus pause versus everything, right? And for that, the right equilibrium and the right ecosystem has to be, has to be set. And the other thing which has been echoed in great depth is the risk of security. Now, I got conned, but so did the Bank of uh, Bangladesh, right, the central bank. So I'm not embarrassed, but it is a real threat, and yeah. it can sort of magnify over time. Thank you, Gautam. I think we, we did uh, want to take some questions from the audience, but I guess we are running short of time. But I can take one question if uh, I see a hand going up there. So go ahead. Actually, it's a safe and secure uh, form of, uh, yeah. it's, so that it's actually safe and secure and it's easy to adopt. So I'm not talking about the India which is here in the urban cities, I'm talking about the rural people. How can we do that? If I may answer on your question. See, the cyber crime, especially fraud in banking, which I have closely seen, 70% of fraud in our country happen out of greed. And that irrespective of village, or Mumbai, or urban, or metros, irrespective of that. 20% happen out of ignorance. 5% happen out of threat that your account will be blocked and you may not be able to do it. 5% out of technology or technology loophole. That's, a, that's a, my, my experience I'm saying. So it's psychological and human. This is psychological. Mm. How are you going to change the tendency of people? Because the moment you say something that I'm giving you freebie, we do not think. How are we going to change the mindset? It is impossible task. We don't, we don't want to talk about the level of education, what banks are imparting for the customer is pointless. I mean, there's no, you know, not, near, not worth you to discuss. What we can do, how are we changing the predictability of the genuinity of the transaction or the way you are behaving in the digital world with your digital footprint? AI, ML, this technology can help you but not to full extent. We have to live with that risk. And eventually, see, when you are, you are carrying your wallet in your purse, uh, in, in, in your pocket, you don't leave it, you know, something like, you know, uh, without any attention, right? How are, we, how are you behaving so casually on digital world? <laughs> There's a fundamental problem. Yeah. No so, There's no technology which can change this mindset. Thank you, thank you, Bharat. 
Uh, there was one question I'll take, I guess we'll have to wrap after this. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. My question is to you, Mr. Chaudhary. So, sir, there is a saying, with power comes responsibility. So, uh, what are the risks uh, you see with this rising wave of technology, especially blockchain and AI being the backbone of, uh, backbone of techno startups? And what are the measures are we planning to prevent or tackle uh, these risks? Thank you. Closing now. If I understand uh, your uh, question, Properly, how the blockchain is going to uh, going to be adopted in the country? Correct, sir. Okay. Um, see, some of the panelists already mentioned about the security risks, particularly for uh, common uh, uh, people. In fact, uh, when I was with the government, uh, we were looking at uh, see a lot of uh, people when they get admitted into the hospitals today. Our uh, sensitive information is in the hospital. We don't know whom all they're say, selling that information, right? We don't have any clue. They will give one uh, single page of discharge uh, summary. That's it. We don't have any access to our own sensitive data. So we were at, the, at, at that point of time, we were trying to blockchain the entire information so that without the permission of the, uh, the patient, um, that information cannot be shared. And even if uh, uh, the, suppose the, uh, I'm the patient, I want to give the permission to the hospital to use my uh, health data to some pharma company. I, I expect the hospital to pay me the royalty because they are using that information to, uh, uh, to sell that to some pharma company. If you can link up that data privacy using the blockchain technology, uh, even the end users will be benefited. They will be commercially also be, uh, and at the same time, I know that uh, who are all using my personal data and where the personal data is going. I think with the Data Privacy Act getting enacted in the parliament and with the blockchain technologies in, uh, now uh, getting uh, the standardized in the country and also also uh, elsewhere, I think uh, the lot of uh, blockchain adoption may happen in such cases where the data privacy is uh, uh, topmost concern for the people, once they get the confidence, yes, my personal data, my information is secure, then I think adoption of blockchain will automatically happen. Thank you. I'm afraid we don't have time, but you are more than welcome to take the questions <coughs> with the panelists separately in uh, offline. Yeah. But I must say it was uh, a, a long discussion in from the, from the content standpoint, but it was short from a time standpoint. Thank you so much for uh, your valuable time and insightful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We move on to our next session now, reimagining the credit ecosystem with alternative data. And it is being moderated by somebody who has no idea what he's talking about. I refer, of course, to myself. Happily, I have a panel that does. So I'd like to invite to join me up on stage, please, uh, Gunit Chadha, founder APAC Financial Services and former CEO of Deutsche Bank Asia Pacific. And also, we'll hear again from Rajesh Mojanka, managing director and CEO of Kia.ai. Vikas Kumar, Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder of LoanTap. And Akshay Marotra, Co-Founder and CEO of EarlySalary.com. Panel of experts in different areas. We have consumer-facing fintechs, we have banker turned non-banker, we have technologists. So we can look at the topic from all the angles it faces. And the first one, and I want to put this to everybody on the panel, please, because I'd be interested in each of your views on this, is what is alternative data? What are we actually talking about when we say, we're using alternative data, or we can do X with alternative data. So let's start from 
the left-hand end with the, the fintechs. What, what's your understanding of alternative data? Um, Robin, I think uh, many of us spoke about uh, what is alternate data, how do we use it, why, why is it used, and what's the benefit of it? See, at most of the time, we're trying to make an algorithm or a scorecard which says that we can predict risk or a customer intent better. Um, a, let's say an erstwhile tile alternator meant capturing, let's say, SMS or some content data of the consumer on a non-financially available platform. But over time, uh, it's actually moved to uh, understand the consumer in a much better manner, re-looking at the same data with your previous experience and giving better results. Now, uh, data is actually very large, right? Uh, at one point of time, we come and talk about millions of data points coming in and we're taking out variables out of it. But let's look at some of the very simple elements, right? How fast does a customer answer the questions? In traditional world, you could not measure that because a person was filling up your form on your behalf, right? And he would always put the right answers. In the digital world, let's say on an early salary mobile app, we are measuring every clickstream data of the consumer. Right. And that goes into a variable to say, uh, if you look at uh, in a larger sense, people in a hurry are more desperate for money, while people who wait out and answer the question correctly are more patient and will be more responsible with the money given to them. Now, uh, now you can use it as a newer variable, or you can say it's a judgmental answer. But over time, it comes as a result to say it adds up to value or not. Now, uh, there are lots of such variables available. Uh, let's say sound. Today, uh, listening to the consumer gives out an answer because NLP is possible on it, right? And there are going to be various things of analyzing how to use alternate data beyond what the normal human eye can look at, right? It's the capabilities of new age companies to analyze that data which makes it us, uh, being called as alternate data. Vikas. Yeah, I agree with uh, Akshay. So basically what we are doing at our side is, uh, you know, you try to combine uh, traditional data like Sybil scores and stuff like that. We typically do higher loan sizes. So uh, I will not shirk from also looking at traditional data. It does have value. So, uh, you know, the basic assumption is now that we have alternate data or modern age data, we stop looking at uh, traditional data. Well, we have taken an approach that both of them are equally important. So we use AI tools and uh, various uh, scoring algorithms to combine uh, various traditional data and modern data. Now the modern data could be a voice, a sound, uh, SMS, the time it takes to respond. Uh, if you get somebody to talk the way the person talks, right? If you do a, a video call with that guy, the way he responds on a video call, each of these data points creates some value in the system. Maybe how many friends he has on Facebook also creates a value, right? So, you mean, you mean those likes are important after all? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, uh, a lot of it helps in fraud detection. So, so if you go and find somebody having only two friends on Facebook, chances are very high he created that account, uh, that Facebook account only to get the loan. <laughs> Right, because normally people would have some more friends, right? If somebody has only two friends, it's a bit scary, right? <laughs> so, uh, and that's quite common actually. People will create a fresh LinkedIn profile three days before applying a loan. People will create a f uh, new email ID, absolute new company. So we had one guy, uh, he created something similar word to TCS. He actually created a fictitious company. He created a fictitious email ID. He created everything around TCS. He just called it tcsinfo.com or something like that. He bought the domain name. He did everything possible to apply for the loan. So uh, going back, so we collect all of this alternate data. And I think the difference between uh, uh, maybe what Akshay is looking at and me, uh, we would be blending more of the uh, old data, uh, traditional data which banking uses and many of the modern data to create sort of a basket of data. But we've also realized that after five, six, eight, ten pieces of data, most of it is just noise. So you, each company has to decide which eight, ten pieces of data is suitable for its segment. Once you do that, broadly it works out fine. Kunit, if I can ask you, how, how, what 
kind of data are you looking at when you're taking decisions in APAC Financial? So firstly, I think, <coughs> firstly, I think uh, Sanjeev called me in here to make Akshay and Vikas look better, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'll take that. See, you're uh, not the oldest person in the room. You're not even the oldest person on this stage. That is true. <laughs> that is true. <coughs> uh, see, what is alternate data is also a reflection that a bit about when is that question being asked. If I go back to my early days in banking, balance sheet was the structured financial data and cash flows was alternate data. I go a decade further, and suddenly the civil scores and everything else became alternate data, right? Because now cash flows were also available. And you go one step further, and now bank statements and bureau scores are no longer alternate data. You have all the other social footprints and uh, everything else, psychometric tests and et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I had some of the brilliant young startups who came into my office over the last couple of years, and they were talking about they had 5,000 data points, right? And, you know, I, I really felt that I was pretty inadequate, right, to, to, to sit across the table with that audience. The fact is, I think it's NRN said this, right? What did he say? In God I have faith and in data I trust. So that is for real. So there is no question that data is king. And the question is, you want 5,000 data points, or as you said, you want 50 data points or five data points. The question is, do you want alternate data as the basis of credit decision or you want that as a, as, a, as a sort of check to your credit decision? What APAC Financial does, right, and I'm saying this not as a sleazy sort of uh, sales pitch, what APAC Financial does is slightly different from what most of the fintechs do. We give zero unsecured loans, all are secured are backed by property collateral, we don't lend to consumers, we only lend to micro SMEs, and we don't lend in urban areas, we only lend in tier four, tier five towns. Now that entire population of micro enterprises in tier four, tier five towns, half of which have never taken a loan in their lives from the formal economy, and as a result, most credit appraisals are assessed, assessment income based, right, without any structured data, most of those uh, most of those need, need a lot of alternate data. But sadly, most of the development in alternate data have happened on the consumer space. Most has happened in the urban space. Most of it has, most of it has happened uh, with customers who have documented income. They have a salary. They have a, they have a uh, tax uh, return statement. They have an employment record. That's not the case in what we do. So yes, our need is serious, that we need to build an alternate data repository, which is what we are doing every single day. Our CTO is right here in the audience, Nikhil, Nikhil Bandi, who came on board recently. And he's building the data so that tomorrow we can use the data more productively. But here's an offer to any one of you who are in the analytics business, who believe you're strong at analytics and transpose your skills from the urban world, from the unsecured world to the secured, sort of semi-urban rural world, APAC has a real offer for you. Just come on board, yeah, right? So back to you, Robin. I... Um, yeah, applications, if anybody's interested, I guess. But having heard from our first three panelists, the man who ought to have the answers is the technologist because We've heard, to an extent, what alternate data is. How do we process it? How do we manage it? How do you, do you how does Kia put it in a form or present it to decision makers in a form that helps them make that decision? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try and give an analogy of a mask because that's what is in at the moment. Uh, of what is alternate data and then get to saying how we are looking at uh, providing it. The fact is that, you know, I had a, I have a handset that recently the operating system gave me a patch of saying that now from tomorrow, after loading this patch, we are going to recognize your face with a mask. And I'm just saying that it was a, just about time I was thinking of dropping it. Um, 
So it's just technology that's come a little late, but the fact is it's very similar to that. Alternate data provides the ability to read someone's ability to take a product or our ability to lend with a mask on. And it's the same way as how banks have classically stepped behind without that operating patch, uh, system patch, to say that we will want to you to pull down the mask and we want to look at your credit score, which looks like this. And then you can put it on and say, now let me decide to take a decision on the loan by seeing what you aren't at just about a minute back. That is, you put on your mask back and I'll lend you back on your credit score. So it was an excuse uh, to say that I will do safe lending. And if you see what the three successful fintechs have done here and changed the landscape of how unicorns have come up in lending space in India or worldwide, it's the fact about using data as a power to lend quickly and seamlessly. It's lending at the quick of, click of a button. So I think from a technology perspective, we've looked at uh, the areas of using artificial intelligence, although that's a cliche, but in true effect, it's to look at saying there is a huge legacy of data or heritage of data, I would like to put it. It's not legacy because it's not going to go away. It's heritage, that's it's going to stay forever and it needs to be protected and it needs to be elevated, right? Um, that data has a lot of meaning in it. I took the example of smelling cinnamon earlier when I spoke. And it's exactly the same, that you need to bring the emotion in the data that signifies saying whether it's a yes or no, based on what you have, than just to say what came from an external agency. Because the whole spirit of the uh, aspect of your relationship with your consumer is the trust that you have in him and he, has, or, he or she has in you. And that is what alternate data looks to build. So what we've done is look to build various areas. So we've, uh, uh, everyone's spoken about it, social media, uh, what data I have in terms of bill payments, what you, data you have in terms of uh, past loans paid, look at the whole bank statement and just run through the script and say, how does that flow work? Look at the social network and those areas to now bring positivity of saying, how close am I to taking a lending decision that could make me give a loan sooner? Okay, can, we, can I come back to you on the point you were making discussing how banks had extended the use of the data and what was alternative five years ago was no longer alternative but was mainstream and there was a new alternative. Banks have a lot of data. There's no doubt about that, but a lot of it is still siloed. Are they at risk of becoming dinosaurs in the new data world? You know, I think bankers may become dinosaurs, but not banks. Uh, I still remember uh, during the global financial crisis, when probably many of the startups didn't exist here, there was a lot of debate whether the shadow lenders were going to go extinct. And some of, her, some of us, certainly I felt at that point of time, that shadow lenders would never get extinct because they were effectively through the global financial crisis and even beyond into the European crisis, shadow lenders were the only ones which were open to lending and banks had virtually shut down their lending into the SME world of each and every country. And so that thesis that you know, shadow lenders were out of business because they did not have liquidity lines from banks and they were becoming uh, extinct was actually, was actually uh, not true. They became even larger and bigger. Today we have a reverse question being asked. Are banks going to go extinct? And I believe that what I've seen now happen across the banking system, and I've been in a few across the three continents, that banks are fast, fast uh, changing themselves as well. And, and once banks actually get their act fully together, and it's happening every single day, you, can, you, will, see, you, will, see, you will see what seems like an elephant out there you will see will gain a huge amount of agility and will become very powerful uh, with the big data in tow. So longer term, not even longer term, I think five years later, your threat's going to come more from the banks than it's actually going to come from the other fintech companies. And be aware of that because banks will have a 500 basis point 
lower cost of funding than most of the fintechs uh, around, right? And that's massive. And not to show every fintech will be able to absorb a 500 basis point uh, differential uh, and not, not have massive compressions in the margins. So I think it's people like on my right, right, who are making banks change. Uh, banks are hiring, I mean, who's the next speaker? I saw Nitin Chug here, right? Coming and becoming the State Bank of India's digital head, right? These guys are changing fast, and so you better watch out from them. And the irony of the situation is that as these fintechs become bigger, and don't get me wrong, APAC is going to go exactly the same way, as I'm sure with many of the others, we're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But the day we become too big, you want to become a bank, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you, you better make sure banks don't run out of business, otherwise you'll be the only bank standing out there. So net net, I think there is room for all of us, right? Fintechs will lead sort of uh, lead the first hundred meters, first sort of few kilometers in the marathon, banks are not so far away. And when banks move, it'll be pretty, tra pretty traumatic for many of the lenders who truly are not adding value to the customers. You know, the previous panel spoke about payments and there was, I was very keenly actually noting down some of the comments which were being made. The question is not whether payment companies are generating consumer surplus, of course they are. But are they going to remain in business and profitably and sustainably? So that's the question, right? And it's the same question all of us should be prepared to ask ourselves. Are we going to be in business if we're not truly adding value to customers, right? Whether that value is coming from tax or whether it's coming from, you know, uh, uh, assessing their incomes better, etc. But back to you. Uh, stay, stay friends with banks. They're going to be around a long time. <laughs> Let's get back to alternative data. And I want to ask you, Vikas, um, the problem, and this has been characterized by some of the things that have been discussed already this morning, the problem with lending at the moment is that it's unequal. Are the opportunities there for alternative data to remove or reduce these lending inequalities? Yeah, I think... Uh that's most probably why alternative data started, uh, you know, existing in the first place. Because uh, when you're underwriting, let's say, tier 3, tier 4, as Gunit also put, uh, the data available is very different, right? So, uh, credit card, we talk so much about credit card. How much of India actually has a credit card? It's negligible. So, as you go into different spaces, and that's where I think the fintechs are ex excelling, you have a different set of uh, alternative data available and you start un uh, using that data to, you know, underwrite that segment. Uh, one of the obviously difficult segments is like the SME segment and the, the farmer segment. So now people are finding alternative data in the farmer's uh, segment right from the quality of the soil. Right? So somebody who has a better quality of soil will most probably, chances that his crop will grow will be better and therefore chances that he'll repay you will be better. Right. So, do you have data about the soil analysis? Yes, you now have. Five years ago, you did not have. So, as we are moving forward, a lot of non-fintech companies are creating data in the system. The fintech companies are consuming that as alternative data to underwrite more and more complex or more and more underwritten, underwritten segments. Right. So, yeah, it's definitely uh, going to be there and it will definitely help us reduce the inequality. Well, let me drill down now with you, Akshay. What do you see as the market opportunity for alternative data or lending based on alternative data? Um, so I think let's look at uh, combining both the two answers here and then with your third question, right? So while banks are going to be very large, uh, fintechs will build up newer alternate ways to attract the next segment customer. But let's not forget that India is still a banked customer base. Right? In fact, I spent some time with a, uh, a large uh, PSU bank. He had one crore active customers. 57 lakh uh, of them had a savings account with them. Right? And I said, and we did some work to figure out how many of them can we actually lend to. Interesting, the number came to 42% of them we can offer an instant credit in the next one minute. Right? Now that just changes the ballpark. Even when you talk to the bank, uh, 
the bank said, oh, we'll be very happy if you can sell to 1% of my customers in the next 12 months. And here we went and said, let's build a partnership. We'll sell to 42% of them in the next one minute. Right? It changes the way you look at all, uh, solving the problem of credit. See, credit is the most universal accepted product in the world. When you give money, people accept it. Right? People have met lots of aspirations in life. Someone wants to buy a TV, someone wants to fuel his company, someone wants to start something new, someone has a cash flow, someone has a medical emergency. But if you give money, people find use cases of that money. Right? And this is what is very important. Can you use data to time when he needs the right amount of money? Right? And, and that is what is successful entrepreneurship. Today, if you look at um, a little company like mine, we're just 457 employees, right? We typically have, we have now done 2.5 million loans, right? This year, coming year, we plan to do another 2 million loans. Whatever we disburse in our first six years, we're gonna do in the next one year. Half of this is not gonna be only on our own platform. We'll work with banks and other financial players to lend to their customers, right? But can you imagine a little platform which has less than 500 employees will go and do two to two and a half million loans without increasing its manpower, using a seamless alternate lending system. 92% uh, of the time we can predict risk uh, three times lower than the bureau can on the same customer segment, right? And when you combine this, right, when you look at the opportunity size, it really changes the way um, lending can help everyone monetize. Right? When you bring in uh, optimization because of alternate data, your OPEX cost to service the consumer comes down. See, everyone has access to similar data today, from a bank to a traditional player. Everyone can get the same bureau, the same bank statement, and a lot more transactional data of the consumer. But can you bring that cost down? Today, let's say at, uh, at my company level, it's sub $5. Cost of actually giving money and recovering money is less than $5. Now look at the operational efficiency. It means that you can give a person, let's say, a 30,000 rupees and still make money where the nearest product from a classical bank, you're 30% cheaper than that. And this is what drives consumption. When you bring uh, simplistic solutions for consumers, when you give transparency, when you ask for less questions, today an average customer, let's say 92% of the consumers who come uh, on our platform gets decision in less than a second. It's a real time non-human interfere decision. He gets money in his bank transferred. He's already with the bank. If my system is there and we can build out so many more things, and this is why people accept products from us. We, we become cheaper than the next banking instrument. We are faster than the next banking instrument. We work maybe directly to the consumer or with his bank, but we make sure that the money comes to you in real time, and that's what people like. And this is not small numbers. Uh, I'm sure if you look at the fintech category, uh, the top 10 consumer fintechs have already done or have active consumers more than the entire credit card industry. The credit card industry is 44 years old. Fintechs are not more than five years old. Right? And look at the speed of acceleration. And this is all coming in very fast. I think it's partnership between data aggregators, banks, fintechs, which will impact more consumers. There are at least 70 crore Indians where lending can be powered in any format from SME to uh, consumer lending. It's really about the coming together of all three entities which will fuel the growth. Right? And can we introduce, uh, let's say, a 10x growth in the next 36 months? And that's the opportunity. Well, I guess it's about managing risk and about managing cost and the technology that does that. Rajesh, if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, uh, so I think in terms of uh, working out technology for alternate data, uh, we, we would look at a uh, model where we are able to pull in data from multiple sources. So it's not just about what's lying in a banking database, but also what's there in the ecosystem. Uh, just to tell you, for example, that uh, the example that Vikas mentioned in terms of farm lending, uh, soil health, uh, the ability to sort of analyze that, whether to say in which, uh, whether are you lending for, let's say, 
buying the seeds. Of course, you have DBT as well now to sort that out. But uh, how are at what time are you financing? Who are you financing? And uh, how well is that going to come out because of that ecosystem for which you financed? So it's not just about who, but also about uh, where, when, and what. So these are the things that we look to cover in uh, from a technology perspective, which obviously means that we will collect data from uh, unstructured sources, such as new, uh, weather uh, reports, uh, feeds that you get from weather uh, reports, feeds that you get from soil health, feeds that you get from in, in terms of agri lending, for example, feeds that you get for uh, consumer behavior, uh, etc., and then look at you know how you determine the credit score. One of the things that we've looked at also is to say that you know. I've always wondered, this as a consumer, that if I had an overdraft in my savings account, my credit score would drop. But if I had a positive balance in my savings account and then took a loan to that effect anyways, my credit rating would go up. And there's no logic to have that. Uh, it's only that I didn't ask for it and it happened for the reason for my credit rating to go down. And those are the simple nuances I think that has to change in the way banks perceive risk and look at models because just having a credit model is not going to affect it. It's as if you're writing an exam with a stencil, so you're going to go slow and probably not finish the exam with good scores. So if you want to really grow fast, you will have to have freehand writing to make sure that you're not stenciling your model, but really using the um, power of data that is outside of what you perceive on that desktop to then aid you with uh, knowledge. So there uh, you have uh, various algorithms like using, let's say, TensorFlow, uh, algorithms, uh, CNN algorithms for detecting uh, uh, change in, let's say, tone of voice, CNN algorithms to detect uh, the aspect of what has been uh, the flow of uh, forms that have been filled by the customer. Also looking at, let's say, a psychometric analysis of uh, uh, when the data is entered by the customer, how soon did you get the answers. Those are the areas that we would look at in terms of uh, providing online data. And I think with the power of smartphones and uh, online sort of uh, access, you are able to then get this data input very clearly from apps. You are able to get this from websites. Your agents who then uh, would also do that. In fact, I think a lot of banks are now looking at fintechs to sort of do origination in terms of loans. And that has become a very successful collaboration tool for banks as well. Um, so overall, I think those are the areas that uh, we provide as technology to make sure that from a back-end perspective, we are able to provide technology that works rather than technology that just uh, people think that would work. It means that you have to derive a lot of meaningful output. It's not just about what technology you used. Like, for example, I can tell you that you can read up today that the prospect of quantum computing is huge. The fact that I can detect that um, Quantum computing being a simple example, as you read on Wikipedia, that you put a, a red ball and a blue ball in a box, and what is the possibility of you drawing a red or blue box? That is how credit model is running today, right? But if I were to shake that and use quantum computing and say, what is the likelihood that it will actually look purple to me? Because it's a combination of red and blue, and there is a mid-state. That is what a credit is. That is what alternate data is, in terms of giving you that ability to lend faster. And those are the technologies that we will continue to use. So I guess to answer your question, artificial intelligence as of today, based on NoSQL uh, data, that is based on reading unstructured data as well as structured data, um, a lot in terms of profiling the customer and ongoing basis. So it's machine learning as well. And uh, what we see for the future is the ability to use quantum computing on a cloud to be able to give proper uh, and quick credit decisions. I would, of course, remind you that the definition that Rajesh was reaching for for a bank there was the institution that offers you an umbrella when the sun is shining and requires it back when it's raining. <laughs> now, before we go any further, can I just have a taster of audience interest in questions? If you've got a question, can I just see a show of hands? Have we got any? Yes. Well, let's, let's move to audience questions before we move to a summary. My question is uh, for Mr. Gunit. Uh, with respect to alternative data point, like as you mentioned in your talk, that bank uh, cash flow statement was alternative data. It became a part of mainstream underwriting model. Now, a lot of fintechs, a lot of alternative data provider are creating a lot of data. 
So how do you see in the going future that so-called alternative data model becoming part of a traditional credit model and they are influencing the decisions? Second is, how, how do you see that they are helping to select customer with help of alternative data? For example, say bank's model say 70% of property value you want to give. To what an extent alternative data can help you that rather than 70% of property value, you can lend them to 90% of property value. So at, at APAC Financial, the, the, tr the truth is that the only basis on which we lend everything of ours happens on that mobile, right? So we are digitized from the right to the front end, right into the back end. The surprising thing is, or maybe it's not surprising, is that even though 50% of our borrowers are new to credit, in those tier four, tier five uh, towns, our cash collections are less than 1% and have consistently been less than 1%. That borrower out there is a very smart borrower, right? He or she know that as they demonstrate less cash propensity and more sort of use digital channels and there's Google Pays and uh, all, over, all over the place, uh, that borrower knows that, uh, you know, it's, life's going to be better for, for the borrower if it gets more into the digitized world. We are also capturing a lot of data. You, you spoke about soil because, for instance, one of the segments we lend to is dairy farmers. And there's a huge amount of science which you can have on dairy, the kind of cow, four buffaloes going to eight, or, six, or is it two going to four, or there's massive differences. You can create scorecards out of that, you can capture a lot of other information about the borrower, about the business, you can start templating it, standardization. The point which I'm making is that we really need help from a lot of the fintech fraternity, from a lot of the analytics fraternity, to come and play in the space where they are not today. And I think there are two errors which we are doing right now. One error we are doing is, as you said, you know, 70% going to 90%, right? Why, why is, can we increase our disbursement to login ratios? Uh, right now it's 30% for us, right? And that's obviously something wrong. But the problem is that the 70% which we are rejecting, you can always design products for them, right? So I think the errors are happening on both sides. At the same point of time, uh, while we are aggregating a lot of data, collecting a lot of data in a form that it is digitized and can be used on the forward, uh, the amount of analytics which is happening in that space right now is not sufficient. And I really hope that that changes over a period of time because when that changes, our OPEX2 AUMs and our ability to increase our disbursement to logins and frankly, value to the customer in turnaround times, uh, et cetera, et cetera, only gets better and better and better, okay? So, so it's really a glass right now, which I think is a third full, two-thirds of the journey is yet to happen right now in the business which we do, which is non-consumer, non-urban, non-documented income. Uh, but it's a very powerful business. One, one thing I want to just share with one of our startups. We started life four years ago. We've been profitable 12 quarters in a row. That's a discipline which you may wish to create or not wish to create. The choice is with you. We wish to create because it's very easy to spend someone else's money, right? But that's a choice for you. It's a choice we created when we started business. So you sort of uh, eat what you kill. And if you've not killed it, you go hungry. Simple as that, yeah. What an analogy to end on. Can we have the microphone at the front here, please? Could... RBI recently has uh, created FinTech department so are they willing to, I um, mean, planning to uh, regulate uh, uh, these fintechs? Yeah. RBI is a, a put a fintech uh, uh, segment inside. So I think we, uh, most of the fintechs, uh, we actually got together and started working to, with the regulator to start coming back on what is our requirement, how do we get representation? So a year and a half back, in fact, um, I'm one of the co-founders who created uh, FACE, the Fintech Association, right? Which is actually lobbying to say we want an SRO. So uh, over the last three months, uh, the regulator actually opened up to say, let's build an SRO specifically for fintechs, because fintech is very complex, right? Uh, the way we uh, grow is disproportionately large. The way we service consumers is also very large. The impact that we're generating is large. 
And the, the regulator understands that the way we run our companies are also going to be very different. It needs a very different perspective. There's a lot of co-lending happening, there's a lot of partnerships happening, a lot of data flows which happens were very different, right? And I think the first part uh, which the industry got together was to churn out um, the rotten apples, right? We saw a year and a half back lots of the subprime lenders coming in from China and Latin, coming into India. Uh, uh, I think almost 380 of them got banned, right? Now it's about regulating the, the good boys Right, making sure that there are processes which are tuned for our business. Right, I think what took place in MFI after 10 years of building MFI, when Amphil came in, like more, more uh, department structure came in, it's going to happen now in FinTech. Uh, we're waiting for the, uh, the guidelines to come out. Uh, clear indications have started coming in that there's an SRO coming in. There is going to be compliance coming in. And today we see the, the industry coming together Unlike any other industry, uh, I would say almost 80% of the industry started coming together and formed these associations so that they can talk and have a common language. And that's already out in the market. Akshay, uh, my question to you. See, your uh, startup company, uh, salary dot, early salary dot com, you must be serving urban uh, workers, urban or uh, uh, semi-urban. How about uh, the farm workers? Are you taking uh, alternative data from the farm workers point of view, even uh, because was also uh, telling that, uh, taking the soil data and all that. So are you helping farm workers? Uh, most of the rural areas, we find a lot of farm workers. They need uh, this kind of assistance, what you mentioned, uh, the credit and all that. Uh, how are you helping that community? Question, sir. May I know your name, please? My name is Chaudhary. Chaudhary. Uh, I, I like the question. I think what you're saying is, how do we look at data coming in of a specific industry? to fuel the demand of people who work in the industry. Um, I think today, uh, uh, we run multiple businesses to fuel this large demand, right? The first is an instant app, anyone can download and take money. The second is true to the name early salary. We actually work with the employer to provide credit to the end employee using an, uh, a data coming in from the employer. So it could be a delivery boy for Amazon working on third party payrolls of Quest where Quest actually feeds data of att real-time attendance, uh, how many times he worked there, what's his daily income, monthly income, et cetera, and provides a deduction system on payroll to us. And that's where we lend to the largest employer in the country where 94% of the employees are gray-collar. Right? So same is universally used for any other employment basis. Right? As long as we have access to data, as long as we have access to deducting money, Right? We can build a product, uh, it could be versatile, it could, maybe I think give examples, um, daily finance for uh, taxi cab drivers, right? because they earn per ride, you can deduct per kilometer. Right? A product functionality is actually built in and live and running. Similarly, a high-end IT programmer who's now started doing, uh, working like a gig economy. Right? Uh, how do you provide, because through the gig you know how much he's earning. So you're discounting the gig income which will come over the next 12 weeks and giving him a credit. See, credit uh, can be creatively used uh, as long as you have access to data. Uh, the example I gave you of Quest, the same example can be used in uh, uh, a gray collar, blue collar economy. And that's what fuels. It's not that we are metro skewed. We started as a metro skewed company because the market takes times to mature, right? Uh, uh, give an example. Bangalore used to be 20% of my volume where I did work in only in 17 cities. It still is 20% of my volume, but now I'm, a, I'm across the country available. Right? But there is a demand available, but data fuels the next demand and next products available for them. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dhawalia calling from, uh, I'm from India Ratings. Uh, my question to Guneet, you spoke about uh, how banks are changing and uh, their cost of capital is, gives them an upper hand. Uh, and as uh, fintechs continues to grow, uh, do you foresee uh, a, a fintech company acquiring smaller banks in India going forward? Before you answer that, I'm just going to say, ladies and gentlemen, this has to be the last question, so good it. Well, it could be, could, could, could very possibly be, though, the, though, though I would think the inverse is more likely. 
the inverse is more likely. I think, I think some really smart, good, young fintechs, fintechs which are getting created would be very logical acquisitions by the banks. So I think it will happen on the reverse here. And for the very simple reason is the impact of that tiny acquisition, and by tiny relative to a bank, could be massive from a bank. So huge amount of uh, value gets created. Uh, but could the reverse be true? Uh, if some of the fintechs are truly, truly well capitalized and they're embedded into the system, yeah, it's, it's absolutely possible. And by the way, I think I'm of the view that banks should do away with these categories of licenses which exist. You know, payment bank and small finance bank and universal bank. If you are, if you're good to, if you're good to, if you're good to do banking, become a universal bank, right? Be subject to the same compliance and regulatory costs, but although also the opportunity set which awaits, and that should come to the fintechs. Hundred percent, I think that should happen, and I would, uh, I would hope that uh, I would hope that the regulators actually uh, make that happen. It'll be good for the industry. Thank you. Let me finish on a final thought for you, ladies and gentlemen. Our topic was reimagining the credit ecosystem with alternative data. The bottom line is that alternative data used correctly, processed efficiently, will improve your ability to lend. It will expand to the underbanked, the unbanked, the MSMEs that are currently failing to get credit. And it will do so in a way that does not increase your risk profile. In fact, done properly, it could even reduce your risk profile. So that's just a little food for thought at the end. I'm Robin Amlo, I'm the managing editor of IBS Intelligence, and for my sins, and also for yours, I am moderating the next session as well. So, can I invite to join me on stage, please, Sheikha Bandari, President, Global Transaction Banking of Kotak Mahindra Bank. Now, before I sit down, you will have noticed this is not a fireside chat as such. It's not a duologue. It's a trialogue. So we're also being joined by Suhail Samir, the Chief Executive Officer of Barat Pay, but not in person. So I trust through the wonders of modern technology that we will be able to see Suhail. There he is, and there are we. Thank you very much for having me. This is the first talk. Isn't Zoom a wonderful thing? Absolutely. All right, let's, let's make a start. Um, and I want to start, actually, while, while, while we've got the connection, because I can still hear you, is uh, start with you, Sahail. The P to M sector, person to merchant, did you find a market or create a market? I think it's a good question. I think, um, uh, to be honest, uh, we believe the market always existed. Um, I think when we started Bharat Pay, uh, our big realization was that actually the peer-to-peer -peer transaction is no different than a peer-to-merchant transaction. It was just classified differently because everyone who was doing UPI was by and large a consumer company. And uh, a consumer company in its uh, sort of uh, attempt to make uh, money uh, was figuring out that merchants possibly, because they are used to a merchant discount rate on cards, uh, on everything else, uh, are probably the right folks to pay you for it, right? So, so it was sort of, uh, and that's why when we launched, uh, UPI was already big in India. 
but if you looked at where peer to peer was uh, peer to merchant sort of paled in comparison to that right and um, and our realization that it's actually the same transfer money going from one bank account to the other and therefore if peer to peer is free why should peer to merchant be charged uh, was sort of uh, what we believe changed the game right so uh, when we launched uh, p2m transactions for free uh we were losing tons of money because we were still getting charged at the back end uh i think uh as luck would have it 6 months into our journey um everyone else including sort of npci and the regulators had the same realization as we had that, that uh, if peer to peer is free why should peer to merchants be charged right so uh, i think we got lucky that by the time that happened we had built a bit of a reputation for being the people who brought it to market uh and therefore have sort of continued to um benefit from but but it was a existing market to be uh, to be honest we just uh tackled it differently and were the first ones to sort of make it free for the merchants now you are the most talked about man in fintech in india and bharat pay has had a tempestuous time would you say you are now in karma waters yeah so i think uh to be honest uh if you think about bharat pay and uh, sorry the answer may not uh, relate to the gallery but uh, but bharat pay has continued to do well through this uh, turpitude uh business continues to grow 10% month on month uh, uh like uh, march is probably going to be all time highest on all metrics we've ever seen by easily 15 to 20% uh from the past uh so there is nothing really which uh impacted the business and that's sort of a, in a way a beauty of a tech led business and not a people led business right so um the business continues to chug along um, after a couple of months of sort of uh, media noise things die down and uh, and you continue sort of building right so that's sort of the stage we are in uh, obviously it was uh, traumatic for the people involved it was a bit unsettling for uh, the team but uh, but past is past the business looks great and uh, from here to uh, back to building mode good to hear let's let me turn now to shekhar bandari of kotak mahindra you've been responsible for developing digital banking for corporates for smes and msmes now let's be honest traditionally banks are pretty reluctant to get into the latter two sectors so why is that and why weren't you so i think good point uh, uh, we generally consider individual first and corporates later in the mindsets that's what the banking has been and uh, that's how the digital journeys with most of the banks also moved uh, i'll answer i think where are we but uh, uh, first uh, overall as a banking uh, individuals individuals demands individuals uh, Uh, choices and individual solutions uh, there was less demand less request from smes corporates and uh, um, and you realized that i think the products were also following accordingly uh, also remember that there are rails which are required for uh, uh, making digital happen so if uh, the regulations were permitting you individual aadhar authentication and vkyc only for individuals and uh, not possible for uh, the Uh, uh, the corporate part uh, you will find the journey is taking a bit uh, uh, longer to do it uh, at kotak we have been uh, at the forefront uh, uh, i don't know whether uh, i think you know it or not uh, we had uh, we, we we can open an account in 3 minutes and we launched it around 3 years uh, uh, i think around 5 years back and i think it became popular 3 years back uh, 811 our flagship product which is uh, more named after 8th of november uh, when the demon was announced uh, by the prime minister uh, uh, we have been able to open the digital bank accounts for individuals sole proprietorships and i think able to take it forward and as the vkyc uh, uh, regulations became uh, uh, more conducive you offered it to all the smes and the corporates as well uh, um, not that i had planned but i think when you see it today there is uh, uh, um, uh, 
the best portal, I think, which gets uh, um, uh, launched for uh, SMEs, which has never been uh, there, uh, for corporates, for MNCs, where you are able to do everything end-to-end -end digitally. So which means uh, uh, the core layer, the middle layer, and the front-end layer, uh, uh, you have uh, something called FIN, F-I-N, uh, which gets launched to actually uh, uh, have uh, the best journeys ever possible, uh, which is, I call, on par with what the individuals experience. So it's about the implementation of technology and using that implementation to take cost out of the equation to make it feasibly profitable for the institution to do what it's doing. That brings me back to Barrett Pay, if I may, Suhail. You're a payments giant, but you don't make money out of payments. How does Barrett Pay make its business pay? <laughs> no. Uh... I think every business has a cost of acquisition. You have to figure out where your cost of acquisition lies, right? So for me, um, payments uh, will always remain the cost of acquisition. We've been sort of the biggest proponents of zero MDR uh, across all payment modes, including cards to the, uh, to the lot of noise we face from our friends and competitors. Uh, but if my business model is based on the premise that uh, payments can't make money long term, uh, then I have no other option but to treat it as cash or not be in business, right? So, uh, so I think the core tenant of sort of where we make money uh, is to provide a series of financial services on top of payment flows to our merchants, right? So whether it is facilitating loans to our NBFC partners, uh, whether it is sort of facilitating investment with our banking partners or P2P NBFCs, whether it is uh, cross-selling insurance um, uh, through sort of our uh, insurance partners and a series of other products like uh, POS machines and uh, speakers and everything else, right? So, uh, and, uh, and sort of it then also becomes a link to our uh, consumer business, which is sort of a buy now, pay later play in the form of a brand called Post Pay. Um, and we can sort of close the loop on uh, consumer sort of being able to transact at a merchant uh, and potentially on QR code uh, over a period of time. So that's sort of the thinking. I think uh, we think of ourselves as a provider of all financial services to a shopkeeper not very dissimilar to what a Paytm or a phone pay would think about when they think about from a consumer point of view, right? So we do the same, but we do it uh, on the merchant side and all other products, uh, whether it's loan facilitation, investment products, um, insurance, uh, uh, or for example, the POS machines, they are reasonably high gross margin businesses, right? So, uh, so payment to me is sort of an entry into the merchant my ability to underwrite a merchant for a loan um, and uh, and sort of is there for a cost of uh, sort of acquisition. I think whether the business will be successful long term or not uh, will depend on how many of these acquired merchants I am able to cross sell one, two, three or four products. Okay, let's, let's turn back to Kotak Mahindra now to Sheikha Bandari. Banking as a service is a hot topic right at the moment. But is it going to actually be superseded or even surpassed perhaps by a fragmentation that sees us talking about payments as a service? So uh, I'll call, I use the three words over here. Uh, I call BAS, which is banking as a service, uh, uh, PAS, which is payment as a service, and third one is a platform as a service. Yeah. And uh, banking as a service uh, is the one which uh, uh, most of uh, the new age banks wants to move in, where also they want to embed the uh, payment as a service as a subset of banking as a service, and they want to move into the platform as a service. What does it mean and how does it differentiate? And uh, given the India infra infrastructure, I think it is facilitated as well. Um, uh, if you have UPI as a rail, I think, uh, uh, which Sohail explained, uh, with 65% of the transactions in India happening on UPI, 19% uh, in value, but uh, when you have that particular volume happening, it is important uh, to realize that you can have a customer, any customer, not necessarily your bank customer, to come to a platform, 
uh, do their work, what they want, and uh, still execute either a transaction or an investment or a purchase um, or an information um, or a credit score, I think, which they may want to. Uh, they want to do, I think, besides that, they want to book a cab, they want to uh, um, have some food. I guess, I think everything should be facilitated is what is either banking as a service or a platform as a service. Uh, I foresee platform as a service uh, 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 being more popular because customers and the customer experience is the one which is uh, 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 going to lead to uh, 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 the choices by the customer. And... Uh, 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 if I were to see, I think, uh, a product which is launched as a pay, pay your contact, so I think you don't want to use any of your networks which are currently, or an IFSC code, or a UPI, uh, um, uh, I think just simple phone number, which is the most important thing in your mobile, uh, you can just pay the person purely based on uh, the number, I think are the ways I think you move forward. So I foresee platform as a service becoming uh, the norm, uh, and the journey to, to, towards that is payment as a service, banking as a service, and platform as a service. So that's not the next big thing, but it's the next, next big thing. Speaking of something that was the next big thing, Barrett Pay, you must have seen Soho growth as a result of the pandemic. The pandemic affected all digital adoption. How has that momentum continued for Barrett Pay? I, uh, uh, that's true. Like, uh, I, uh, unfortunate, but I think uh, uh, pandemic, as it happened, uh, was sort of a big boom for digital payment. It's, uh, I think sort of uh, sad saying that, given what transpired. But, uh, but from a, uh, and it's very, uh, it's very easy to sort of uh, see how, right? So, a lot of there was a very tiny subset of uh, India which was sort of using digital payment, right? So, uh, like. Take anyone's home as an example. I don't think my parents had ever used any mode of digital payment in their life. Cash was the default. Um, maybe my dad used a bit of credit card, even though sort of uh, he spent all his life with SBI uh, and was a lifetime banker and still sort of was more comfortable using cash himself. I think pandemic changes that completely, right? A uh, uh, lot more people started paying digitally uh, and therefore for us, because we are the recipient end of the transaction, a lot more consumers started demanding UPI and digital payment modes at the store, and that's sort of what led to our growth. I think, uh, to me, uh, the trend obviously will continue. Uh, we've seen it sort of uh, like if I go back two years back, uh, we used to believe that digital payments are only relevant in the top 30 cities of the country. Today, I see much of my growth coming from after wave three, from tier three, and beyond. Right. So, uh, so you're sort of seeing UPI go deeper and deeper in the country. Uh, a lot of people on the consumer side on UPI as they are coming in, like for example, WhatsApp Pay. Uh, we still have only 100 million people in India using uh, UPI. You have 400 million people using WhatsApp. Right. So, what that can do through the adoption of digital payments and UPI payments, uh, sort of only time will tell. But sort of seems a very telling moment. Right. So, uh, so I think. Uh, I do believe sort of UPI uh, will continue to grow at sort of an enormous rate, at least for the next uh, few years. Um, I do believe sort of uh, one leg which is still not uh, covered by payment is we have one side credit uh, in the form of credit cards, etc. And some of the people like us doing buy now, pay later. Uh, you have UPI which is taken debit by strong. Uh, like at some stage, I do believe these two will sort of merge, right? And and credit on UPI, um, and again RBI is still thinking through on how to make uh, how to make it work. Uh, working with sort of bunch of payment guys as well as a bunch of banks uh, to really enable it. But I think that will sort of drive the next level of growth, right? Because a lot more people are still comfortable. Uh, using credit, why pay it today if we can pay it one month later? And sort of as as UPI enables that, that will probably be the next big growth on digital payments, right? So, um, and the last part, sort of, I am very bullish on, and uh, maybe uh, our other guests will have sort of have a better sense because I am still seeing it from the outside. But I am um, generally sort of very bullish on. Uh, credit card payments and post payments still continuing to grow uh, as 
especially if we can get the tap on phone and tap on pay to sort of uh, uh, really take root, right? Uh, there is still a bit of trust issue of me basically taking out my credit card and tapping on your phone. Uh, part of it will sort of go with time, but I think that's sort of uh, what we really unlock because uh, because boss machine is still cumbersome. It still needs to be delivered. It still needs to be serviced. Uh, if we can sort of really make uh, uh, tap on mobile phone work, uh, I think that may take away uh, again a large part of the cash economy into digital payments. I think the problem with payments is that nobody thinks about payments. What I mean by that is the payment is not the end result. The payment is the process, whether you're a consumer or a business. If you want to pay for something, it's the something you want, it's not the payment. So there's one particular company that's had 20 years of making this very simple for people, as simple as possible, and that's Amazon. And I'm gonna use a word that I'm sure you should all be familiar with now, and that's the Amazonification. The Amazonification of payments, both B2C and B2B payments. This is what we're talking about. Payments need to be simple, they need to be quick, they need to be real time, and they need me not to have to think about the process. I just want to click a button and have done. Is that unreasonable, Shaker? No, no, very fair, because uh, uh, that's what India has done. If you were to see uh, uh, simple and fast, I call my personal mantras, but I think that has been executed across, uh, especially on the payment side. Uh, UPI is uh, uh, one-click journey, two-click journey. Uh, payments to your uh, um, mobile apps, payments to your uh, um, bill pays, BBPS, uh, um, uh, through your uh, fast track, um, uh, I think they all are meant to ensure that uh, you are able to have it contactless, secure manner, and very, very fast. Um, the Indian journey on that part looks uh, uh, quite good, and I would want that, can I offer the similar thing in a very seamless manner to the corporates? And when corporates do it through the cash management part, all the solutions, the big ones are able to do it, but a merchant which is my Kirana merchant, can they do it, is where I think uh, uh, Sohail was explaining to make this entire journey simple and fast. I still feel there are lot many uh, partners in the entire journey to do the final payments. And when the hops are many, which is two, three, four, five, it can be issuing bank, receipt bank, clearing bank, uh, uh, partner one, partner two, and the merchant, uh, there has to be uh, skin for each one of them uh, to operate. Uh, so the objective of making simple and fast at zero cost, uh, and that being the mantra, uh, uh, you need to ensure that the hops are minimum, and uh, you need to have across journeys, whether it's individuals or corporates, to have uh, uh, those payments done. Uh, Come back to the, I think, uh, the account opening, which I was saying. If you're able to open the account in three minutes and you open 16,000 of them, you realize that I think that is a real solution. If you open only a couple of them and 16,000 of them every day, is what I think when you do, you say I think it's a simple, a few clicks journey, and same thing is required for payments across. Uh, so, Hal, I saw you nodding along there. I assume you agree absolutely with what Shaker was saying. What is Barrett Pay's own position? Uh, I absolutely agree. Actually, I have nothing to uh, add. I would have, uh, it seems like I would have used the exact same words to uh, describe this. Uh, I think, um, like, uh, we used to, I, though I will sort of uh, want to uh, go back a bit and, uh, and actually talk about, uh, uh, I structurally believe India has done great work on our payments. Uh, uh, processes, right? Not only for corporates, and uh, um, uh, but uh, but lot obviously lot more for individuals. Um, and at least my personal experience, um, I'm actually only used to banking in India, so uh, I didn't know it better. But um, I recently set up my first international bank account, um, and I had to transfer. It was very sorry for a bit of a sidetrack, but it was a very uh, simple transaction where I had to transfer some thirty-five thousand dollars to a company I was investing in. Uh, 
and i made some mistake instead of sort of adding him as the wire transferee i added him as a bank transferee uh, and that opened up a large loop of like transaction being declined money going out of the system coming back eventually with full follow up it took me 11 days to transfer my money to the uh, to the company involved right uh, and like i have always grown up with uh, sort of abusing the indian banking system of how slow we are and that actually changed my outlook completely on sort of uh, and i use uh, kotak uh, as sort of the bank i work with uh, and then sort of that makes me uh, reflect and really appreciate what sort of uh, uh, the banking system in india has done right so uh, as as we spoke about there is still a lot more to be done especially on the corporate side but i think uh, our sort of banking stack and technology is uh, at least way ahead of a lot of other markets i see and these are developed markets these are not sort of struggling markets you mentioned there's a lot to be done on the corporate side well i have a a corporate and an sme banker sitting next to me shaker is it inevitable that we see advances in consumer finance first before we see advances in corporate finance but is it always going to be b to c first and then b to b as a, a an afterthought uh so i think if you were to see the digital part uh, uh mm, so 70 to uh, 2000 Uh, you found that corporates were the first and the consumers were to follow uh, we all experienced it as an individuals as well as as corporates why do i say that because if you wanted to make a bulk payments corporates were able to facilitate not uh, or corporates were able to do it not necessarily individuals uh, individuals used to fill up i think a lot of forms go to the respective branch and then uh, do the payment corporates used to fill up one particular form and i think they, they all the payments or thousands of them were made at that point of time uh 2002 2003 onwards to uh, uh 2020 i'll say that uh, it is consumer which came first and when the aadhar part actually became uh, um, the thing so i call india got jam which is uh, uh jandhan which is j a is aadhar and m is mobile and when uh, so there is one is english jam there is hindi jam and this is i call the uh, the real jam uh, as far as financial services is concerned Uh, just for you robert i think uh, uh, hindi jam means uh, um, that uh, you cannot go ahead it is uh, in, so it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge to go ahead is jam uh, the english jam is the bread butter and jam and uh, and the real jam what you call is financial services <laughs> is having lot many bank accounts so 65% of indians having uh, bank accounts is jandhan aadhar which is uh, uh, all of us having an identity called as a digital identity which can be verified was uh, aadhar and uh, mobile which i think uh, significant amount of penetration so when you have uh, um, on an average 85% of indians having mobile uh, 40% of them in smartphones you generally find that the combination of j a and m actually facilitated the individual side to be done at an advanced manner and uh, uh, come now i think 21 onwards and etc i have seen again uh, that the smes corporates mncs and bfcs and the large corporates i think again gaining prominence to be on the digital side thanks to pandemic as well as it was explained that uh, all these things got expedited something which they were very reluctant they want to do it i think uh, everything online uh, a lot many taboos in our mind and customers mind uh, uh, got addressed thanks to pandemic Well, we've had the building blocks of where we are now. Uh, I'm now going to introduce a word into the equation that strikes fear, confusion, or totally blank looks, and sometimes a combination of all three. And that's blockchain. Um, this is a question to both of you, but I'll start with you, Sir Hale, if I may. How do you see the role of blockchain in payments? What's it going to do for Barrett Pay, if anything? Yeah. Uh... Uh, very exciting space um, uh, to be honest i think there is a uh, crypto noise uh, takes away some of the sheen of actually what the blockchain technology is supposed to enable uh, i am sort of a, a big believer in the technology itself uh, uh, sort of irrespective of what my view on crypto is and i'll sort of uh, just give a very small example to sort of uh, make it come to life right so um, like if i simply think about cross border transactions right uh, 
the amount of sort of uh, amount of loops you have to go through to enable a transaction the leakage you have to sort of incur in terms of transaction costs and uh, sort of currency conversion costs if you sort of enable blockchain transfer of uh, stable coins or sort of some other form of asset uh, it suddenly makes the experience seamless instant and probably with much lesser cost and friction right so let's just one example right but uh, but the wider point is sort of what the technology can do to payments uh, is to uh, get us closer to our vision of uh, frictionless fast single click and sort of cheap payments right or uh, as close to zero cost payments and and that's where sort of my excitement on the technology comes from uh obviously lot more work to be done and a lot of regulatory thinking to be cleared on what would be allowed what would not be allowed but uh, but sort of the start and the progress on the technology is very very promising uh, we've been toying away with sort of uh, enabling some of the features on our uh, on our apps uh, but uh, still early days on our development journey so we'll probably see a product uh, uh, 6 to 12 months down the line from the bharat pay stable on Okay, I said it was a question to both. So, Sheikh, your views on blockchain in payments? Uh, I think blockchain as a technology, um, I've been a very strong propagand for last five years. Uh, mm, I think let us see. I think what are the important parts of payments? We address simple, we address fast. Uh, there are two things we still need to be addressed, which is uh, it has to be secured, and I think it has to be trustworthy. And I guess blockchain actually brings in those two elements very, very strongly. uh currently the trust and security is coming from the word called bank bank to bank transfer and the stamp of the bank uh blockchain technology will actually bring in uh, 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 the additional layer of uh, trust and security in addition to what is happening on simple and fast and i foresee that whether it is on the domestic side or on the cross border it will actually propel uh, the entire proposition Uh, will it be uh, 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 equally cost effective enough uh, uh, i still have question marks in my mind it has to be facilitated to make it a uh, 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 facilitate over there but uh, if i were to look at the other areas uh, especially in trade finance uh, securities settlements uh, i have seen i think blockchain actually gaining uh, 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 strides over there uh in india 18 banks have come together to form a company called blockchain infrastructure company uh each of the banks have contributed uh a 50 million uh, rupees as a capital and uh, and working on to ensure that uh, the entire trade finance which is domestic in nature uh, which has i think so just to give you a magnitude uh, uh, when you do a trade transaction 180 documents are required by various entities and uh, um, over a period of on an average 14 to 20 days uh, can you reduce 180 pages to 11 pages and can you do it instead of 14 to 18 days to probably 2 to 2 and a half days and then to 4 hours is where the entire process moves uh, and just think of all these thing resulting into the working capital management which is becomes more efficient uh, uh, cost of funding and the real uh, uh, part coming in um in trade finance the cost parts gets addressed because there are real challenges real pains over there but uh, blockchain as a technology i have been a strong propagand and now i feel that probably 22 to 25 will see the real uh, uh, solutions uh, uh, coming and i also foresee the way in payments india has been uh, at the forefront uh, uh, probably in blockchain trade finance you can see i think uh, uh, another uh, i think solution coming from india okay Well, you 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 talk there about the coming together of, of banking institutions on a specific issue, admittedly. But let's explore what's going on in the payments industry, and this again is a question to both of you. Where are the power? Where's the power? Well, what are the power dynamics in payments? Um, so, Hale, if we could start with you again. Sorry, I uh, I missed part of the question. You said what are the power dynamics in payments? Uh, yes. What? Are, who's who who's driving things is it a government thing is it consumer expectation is it regulation is it international regulation so i think uh, uh, obviously to, to be honest the real answer is all of this right so uh, consumer expectations in india we are very consumer uh, 
service oriented country uh, consumer expectations in india are always sort of ahead of the curve right so and there is no shying away from it and there are enough companies trying to solve this and sort of cater to the same consumers so uh, that sort of drives uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing that drives a lot of innovation right so uh, so i think it's probably consumer expectations first but um, but i do want to sort of give credit to the government and the regulators uh, and npci and rbi i think whatever i have seen so far and uh, and the banking folks probably see them a lot more uh, is i believe sort of they are very very innovation pro right so um, the, like at least my articulation on this is uh, they let sort of uh, innovations happen they let experiments happen when those experiments become large enough to be called systemic that's when sort of they start regulating right so over regulation tends to sort of uh sometimes kill innovation right and uh, and i think sort of um, rbi and npci and the other regulators uh at least in the financial services space have done a good job of sort of balancing uh balancing the two uh, uh but like with everything in india i think it's sort of consumer first i think that's sort of my i'll ask the same question of you shaker uh from my point of view i'll say that uh, data technology and regulations become the three critical parts of uh, the future of payments uh, everybody has data but are you able to understand the data massage the data and uh, provide a, a, a solution to the customer so yes consumer is important but i think the future consumer requires a lot many things out of the payment data uh, tech i assume that since Uh, um, all the devices will be able to speak to each other and then able to come out with a score oblique solution uh, uh, in the future world uh, uh, you will find that uh, yes uh, uh, there has to be the security and the trust aspect which has to be taken care of i call that so data will come in you will be able to do everything with data but the data security along with the way i think you can uh, work on that and regulatory framework with respect to each one of those that uh, what you will do on uh, terms of uh, taking the data sharing the data security uh, um, and the future regulations uh, with respect to even uh, creating the rails please do remember that uh, uh, the rails in india are owned by public uh, uh, or or rather than i think privately owned uh, um, uh, i think they are in good hands uh, uh, but it is important they need to be equally secured and it need to be Uh, uh, future looking uh, i would uh, uh, ideally like to have watch all these three parts and uh, i always take examples uh, uh, and uh, which is i think the future of either the payments come in um, i have a servant at uh, uh, my place uh, i think who probably may be earning around uh, 25000 rupees a month uh, by working in two or three houses uh, will not get credit from any of the institutions it won't get it from uh, a bank it won't get it from a fintech it won't be able to get it from anywhere why because i think his data will be generally less available uh, can he be lent uh, i guess 100000 rupees my answer is yes uh, uh, who lends it to him currently i guess he takes it from a private lender at a rate which is four times what the bank lends this is what the present part is uh, is it an exception no because i think i go and move into my uh, vegetable vendor and uh, uh, yes you take a few thing from uh, uh, the web uh, from the new age companies but i think you see uh, what is happening on the economy as well and uh, they all use qr as a uh, mechanism to accept the payments but not having an access to uh, uh, get the credit i think uh, uh, the fruit vendor must be doing in my mind uh, a business of uh, again in indian rupees around uh, 15 to 20000 rupees a day and then i think uh, uh, not able to get enough credit uh, he or uh, um, he also will be borrowing at 3 uh, to 4 times of what the bank rate is or twice of what the fintech lend and uh, one two three four five cases each one of them i see uh, i see that as an opportunity uh, so there is a payment which is happening uh, uh, it is getting captured uh, in some manner or not getting captured but it is not getting massaged enough to have a, a good score for the individual who is actually doing it uh, to really make a solution so the future is in my mind uh, data the way the devices talk to each other called tech and uh, and the regulations which will probably try to Uh, have uh, um, all of them being in a good secured and uh, uh, used in a proper manner well to, i think you 
probably covered part of the answer to the next question I'm going to ask in what you've just said, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it's the last question from me before we let the audience have a go at you both. So, Shaker, starting with you, what would be your key prediction about the shape of the payments landscape over the next three to five years? I think it has grown very well in the last uh, uh, four years. Uh, it will only uh, multiply from here. Uh, if we think we have uh, reached a peak and from here on we will, uh, will pause. So uh, I foresee payments industry to grow on an average at I think uh, uh, 25 to 35 percent per annum for next four years from here. Uh, and you will have enough number of customers, enough number of opportunities uh, and Payments actually to become um, a lead for doing all the other financial products. Uh, there are a few firms which have started uh, working on it, uh, including traditional banks and the fintechs. But uh, 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 data is the new oil. I think you will be able to see the same part. I think data being an important part and regulations being an important part to uh, make the future of uh, payments and finance. Same question to you, Sahel. Apart from Barrett Pay taking over the world, what is your key prediction for the next three to five years? No, um, I actually agree with Shaker, right? So I think, uh, like, if, uh, if, if I could sort of literally guess five years out, I will easily expect sort of payment flows, uh, industry payment flows to be four, five X of what they are today, right? Which, uh, which probably roughly translates to the same 25, 30% growth, uh, which Shaker sort of talked about. Uh, um, like, I think India is generally an innovative country, uh, so I will not be surprised with sort of one or two new payment modes sort of emerging, which will uh, sort of become meaningful in terms of sort of their contribution to economy. Whether it's like my bet is on tap on pay, uh, tap on phone, but uh, but let's see uh, where that goes. But um, but sort of, and I do believe sort of the uh, while all this innovation is happening, UPI and the credit rails or the card rails keep on becoming stronger um, and will sort of keep on growing uh, irrespective, right? And uh, I think my sort of other prediction is uh, that payments will keep on going cheaper and cheaper. It's been seen across the world. Uh, uh, it is sort of being played out in India with UPI and now Rupay. Uh, I will not be surprised the day where actually we pay consumers for payments uh, and figure out how to recover that money from elsewhere, right? So again, maybe it's too forward looking, but um, but overall, I believe sort of payments will tend towards zero cost uh, and uh, and sort of banks, fintechs, everyone will sort of keep on innovating to find new profit pools uh, on the back of that data of payments, which we will sort of process. Thank you very much. Now, before we round up, I'm going to put my spectacles on so I can see the audience. I don't know if that was a good idea or not. Probably not. Um, questions from the audience. This is your chance, ladies and gentlemen, to grill one or both of these fine gentlemen on stage and on screen with me. Anybody have a question? Have we beaten you all into submission? There's a gentleman there. I have one question for both of you. Uh, so I think the you know the most important thing that you're saying that data is going to be crucial, and the reason why data is going to be crucial is you can select the right individuals to lend to, right? Now, but with competition and when everyone is doing the same thing, uh, do you fear that you know you could start or you could be looking at a subprime crisis somewhere down the line? Who wants to take that first? So, Hale, do you want to go first on that? Why not? Uh, yeah, and I'm giving my Shekhar view on this will be uh, different. I don't actually foresee that. Uh, I think everyone is sort of going to go after more and more data because I think that's what is required to underwrite uh, uh, consumers for lending. And of course, uh, I don't think either me or Shekhar meant only from a lending point of view. Uh, it has sort of 20 other use cases, but let me take the lending example. Uh, whatever said and done, 75% of India does still does not have access to credit. Uh, whatever said and done, only 4% of India's population has credit cards, or four and a half now. Uh, 
like if anyone uh, were to try and guess the sme space lending credit gap like credit needed not received uh, i think the world bank pegged it at 500 billion uh, two years back right so uh, so there is obviously risk of underwriting on the back of incomplete data and probably leading to some uh, delinquencies but i think uh, all the people playing in this uh, market like whether it's banks like kotak or someone like us i think are smart enough to learn from the our models and sort of improve it over a period of time right so i think as you try to build something new it is inevitable that um, that some money will be invested whether it's on a customer acquisition or taking loan losses as sort of the cost of learning but i think structurally what we have as india covered at least on the credit side uh, is just top of the top of the uh, funnel right now right so huge market to grow and that's why so many of these banks sort of coexist and that's why there is room for so many large nbfps like bajaj finance and that's why there is room for uh, some of us fintechs to sort of play in the same market right so it's a massively credit starved market uh, Uh, I think right now, as a country, we should be worried about credit inclusion versus worrying about over credit leverage. And Shaikh, so I think I'll only explain that subprime happens when the actual amount of loan which is given is much much higher than the intrinsic value of the security. So, example, when you are able to have a house which is valued at. Uh, a million and you are able to lend with various structures 4 million through various structures i think that's when subprime happens so this is the case where uh, the data is uh, uniform across i don't know whether you know it uh, or not there is a framework called account aggregator which has come in and formulated in india where an individual consents to give its entire data uh, and uh, where all the lenders since we are talking of lending i think uh, are able to see the same data and please do remember as a part of the entire infrastructure anyone who is being lent is being reported by all the respective institutions across that how much has been lent and how much has been uh, and and what is a outstanding at end of every month so to specific point of subprime i don't foresee that happening with uh, uh, what the current infrastructure and the proposition which is there if you prepare structures based on uh, 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 the actual lending uh, 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 you can have key example the pool is 4000 crores um, which has been done and it is sold at 1500 crores based on asset prices prices which has gone up and then that 1500 crores is again i think marketed uh, uh, something more at 2500 crores uh, that's when the subprime happens uh, in this case it is we are talking of 1000 crores and intrinsic value of 1000 crores and if you know of an institution that isn't following the sensible advice you've just been putting forward i've got a bridge in brooklyn that i could get them to refinance any more from the audience come on boys and girls wake up any more in which case we will wind things up and let me say thank you to sir hail samir from barrett pay who's oh You went. Now you've come back. Oh, I'm, here. I'm here. Thank you very much indeed for your time, sir. Well, thank you for joining us, and let me also say thank you to Sheikh Abandari of Kotak Mahindra Bank. And if you would show your appreciation in the usual way, I'm sure they would both be gratified. And I know that was for them, not for me. Thank you very much. So now we, we reach the last of our sessions, uh, but by no means the least, uh, the growth of BMPL into B2B. So um, I'd like to welcome on stage Nitin Chug of State Bank of India. And Rajiv Janjanam of RBL Bank. And the session will be moderated by our colleague Gaia Lamperti, who's reporter, global markets from the IBS Intelligence London team. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, team, for the introductions and welcome. Um, so, as we just mentioned for our last session, we are going to discuss one of the hottest markets in fintech right now, 
which is buy now, pay later. Um, the sector is growing at an incredible fast pace. Just to put some figures out there, Indian's buy now, pay later market is estimated at three to 3.5 billion today. But it could potentially grow to 45 to 50 billion by 2026. Much of this growth has been happening in the last two years, but the model has been around for quite some time. So I'd be interested in learning from you, Rajiv and Nitin. Uh, when was the first time you heard about buy now, pay later? Or when did your organizations started engaging with this model? Nitin? Okay. So it was, uh, I mean, we've heard this uh, buy now, pay later in various forms for years now. Uh, in fact, decades. Uh, and there are obviously articles out there that says that you know, it was available even in the 1800s. Uh, uh, but it so happens that in the last four or five years, we've seen this grow uh, tremendously. Uh, in a way, it becomes so fashionable that you, uh, you know, have a BNPL limit, uh, especially with the youngsters or the millennials. And the adoption is also picked up uh, with the Gen Zs. Um, my trust or our trust at the bank uh, with Buy Now Pay Later uh, started four or five years back when we wanted to do something for the uh, merchants, uh, sen essentially the ones who were making purchases from wholesalers and uh, you know, wanted to get that financed okay, uh, for maybe 15 days to 30 days. And it wasn't really called as Buy Now Pay Later then, uh, but essentially the structure was more or less similar. Uh, the only difference there was, um, you know, there was a little bit of interest rate or a fee that they had to pay for that 15 days of credit. Uh, but now that seems to have vanished, uh, especially when it moves to the consumers. And over the years, we've observed that, you know, this is a product, uh, though, you know, the way I see it is something that um, has built itself on the way credit card works. Uh, but a little more from the acceptability and you know wider presence, it's available for a lot more people than uh, let's say credit card could penetrate. So um, that's where we heard about it. Uh, I mean, we've been uh, doing some bit of experimentation around it, uh, but I think there's a lot more to do on this. Absolutely. And Nitin? I think I think the the fashionable name probably came on the scene maybe three years ago, so that's when BNPL as a new acronym for the category of lending has come up, and that's when we heard about it, of course. And uh, yeah, the concept is not very new, the concept is old, but I think it does require a new way of delivering the same service every now and then, so it's, it's good that we are calling it very clearly buy now, pay later, and not anything else, because it clarifies things even for the end user. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, fast forward to now, not only this payment method has been highly adopted in the B2C sphere, but it's also increasingly becoming popular in B2B contexts. So what, according to you, Nitin, um, are some of the key trends behind this growth in the B2B segment? See, the trends are a little early right now. So it's difficult to hard code them and say that these are the trends which will, you know, keep taking shape over the future. But yeah, these are early days for B2B BNPL. And most of us have been uh, surrounded with the consumer side of BNPL dialogue. Uh, but I think what's really driving this is the fact that from a technology point of view, it's not very different. The algorithms that you can use for B2B BNPL are probably different, but the underlying technology is the same. So the tech is available, so I don't see a reason why that use case would not have come. That's from the tech point of view. Two, I think we have a lot of very good quality, high quality fintechs who have taken this forward, right? So there are, there are people who are going to be able to provide this. So there are providers. From a consumer's point of view, which is the third category, I think there was always a demand. And this was a demand which was served in the traditional manner through either factoring or invoice discounting or trade credit or whichever way we want to call it. Uh, but there has been just an enormous amount of friction 
and payment cycles have been, you know, to whatever extent. I think it's reasonably acceptable that these payments come over 60 days to 90 days for the suppliers. So there has always been this demand. And even though we have been in a period of excess liquidity for the last two and a half years post-COVID, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the suppliers start getting access to that liquidity all the time. So it is, it is in their interest to manage their cash flows in a manner that they get those payments upfront through a BNPL proposition. Part of this, I think, was also tried, uh, you know, people tried to solve this through the commercial cards in the past. And commercial cards have also had a very strong use case for, let's say, fleet cards or, you know, all kinds of other purchasing that happens, you know, on a B2B basis. But then cards get restrictive because of the interchange. Uh, cards get restrictive because of acceptance. And they also get restrictive because of the lower penetration, especially in a market like India. Like in US, many years ago, even the... Uh, the Fed used to buy, or oh, sorry, the, the, the government entities used to buy a lot on commercial cards, and it was quite common. In South Africa, it was very common. But I think that phase is probably over. BNPL seems to be replacing cards. Like in the consumer side, they are adding a new category of the excluded ones. On the B2B side, it seems that they are coming up with an alternative to cards which could be, you know, more, uh, you know, higher on the price point side. But because the tech is available, because the demand is there, because it's a need which has not been met completely, I think these are the reasons why this is taking shape. And of course, the best thing is that we have a lot of providers now in the form of fintechs, and banks are also not far behind. Fantastic. Um, Rajib, do you have anything to add on this point? Or? No, I think uh, Nitin covered it perfectly. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, so we are at the payments and lending conference. And by now, pay later is often defined as a payment method, but we could argue is closer to a lending product. Um, so Rajiv, you have expertise in digital lending. Um, so how would you compare buy now, pay later to other products like term loans or credit cards, as we mentioned? Uh, being a banker, I'll first call it as a credit product than a payment product. Uh, payment product, uh, essentially comes in when you're actually deploying that credit. Uh, so when you're underwriting a borrower for uh, BNPL, uh, there are multiple ways in which you can do it. Uh, if you want to try it out uh, uh, by not really having strict filters and give small and then grow later uh, on that particular borrower, uh, that's another way to look at it. But uh, essentially, if you do not uh, you know, underwrite it properly by taking adequate uh, information about the borrower, then uh, it, it remains a uh, you know, risky portfolio to hold. Okay. Uh, comparing it to term loans, first of all, uh, is way off. Term loans are very different. Uh, term loans are availed uh, by uh, you know, sufficient documentation. Uh, there is time taken before, let's say, in the segment of uh, businesses, uh, it doesn't happen instantly. Um, for consumers, yeah, you can give a term loan instantly, but uh, for businesses, it doesn't happen instantly. Uh, and uh, in term loans, you um, it, there's no concept of pay for what you use, right? So you take a bulk and then use it as uh, you need, but you're paying for uh, the entire term in form of interest, right? Uh, but when it comes to uh, credit cards, I think you know they've taken the best of credit cards and then made it a little better in a way to look at it, and. Uh, you know, of course, how is it very different from a credit card? Today, BNPL is offered to almost uh, everybody, right? So new to credit, uh, someone who's uh, thin file, uh, in a way, as in uh, he doesn't have too much of credit history. Uh, you start them off at 3,000, 5,000 kind of limits, and then uh, through various, uh, you know, repayment cycles, you realize that, you know, he's a little more credit worthy than what we thought in the initial phase, and therefore up the limit at a late point in time. So that is where it differentiates. Second is, uh, you know, credit card penetration is fairly low. Uh, I mean, we heard Sohail in the previous one say that it's around 4% or 4.5%, right? Uh, but uh, BNPL is fast catching up. It may not replace credit cards. Credit cards will continue to grow, but uh, uh, this is something that's going to be there. and whether it will remain the way it is right now uh, or there will be some kind of regulations which will alter the way it works, uh, but uh, it's there to stay, and it's shown. I mean, last uh, 
few years of data shows that you know it's a product that is essentially required uh, for consumers. Uh, it's penetration into B two B purchases or you know B two B commerce uh, has been picking off for the last uh, you know maybe year year and a half. There are very few players right now, but uh, there is an absolute use case there, and uh, I see that as becoming uh, something more important. Uh, rather than you know just another option, but becoming an essential option for them, uh, for businesses. Fantastic, and you made a great point because you were saying how inclusive um, this model is. It's available to everyone, and it, it's becoming very popular. Um, so, Nitin, you've touched upon some of its benefits um, for the merchants, and currently, by now, pay later forms about two percent of the total of total retail and this was taken from the annual BNPL report by Just Money. Um, and you know, if I think of benefits for merchants and buyers, I can think of high volume of transactions, improved cash flow, um, short term financing of course. Um, but what are some of the others, you know, long term benefits that this model offers in, in B2B? I think, of course, these are these are the need-based benefits that the, the the overall business can address in any case, right? So there is a need for a working capital; it addresses that on the seller side. There is a need for the buyer to be able to pay in time to be able to leverage the inventory or to be able to use the uh, funds appropriately, or whichever way. I think it it makes a lot of sense for them also. <clears throat> but I think uh, the the Larger benefit is really going to be in terms of including many more people who are so far either in the informal category or they do not have evidenced uh, documents to show that they can actually be eligible for credit the traditional way. So as and when these people, because if they are moving towards any kind of digital buying, which presumably a lot of people have already moved to, even if they are smaller enterprises, uh, there is enough and more data that's getting left behind, even though their files might be thin on the bureaus. So using that data, and that is where the tech, tech part comes in, it is possible now to be able to lend to those people and include them in the formal credit cycle, credit category. And that hopefully will build you know, greater demand for formalized credit rather than the informal credit or you know, the high rates of uh, credit that they have access to right now. So very clearly, I think this certainly broadens the overall formalization agenda. <clears throat> it, it addresses the formalization ag agenda and broadens the overall scope of the informal category of uh, businesses that can participate in this. From the seller's point of view, I think it's, it's reasonably clear. Um, however, they also need to undertake changes in the way that they manage their buyers today. So today, even that process of selling to the buyers, let's say it's a large manufacturer, goes through a distributor, goes through a, you know, a, a, an aggregate retailer and then to the final retailer. That whole process today is reasonably traditional. Yes, they've started using a lot of tech in terms of you know, tablets, etc. But most of the sales process is still very, very people dependent. Okay? So as and when the sales process starts to get transformed, then there is more data that is left behind. And that hopefully will create new categories which are just not the, the logical trade-led categories that, okay, here is a category of people who sell ready-made clothes. Here's a category of people who sell stationery. Here's a category of people who sell, let's say, uh, grocery. But you, there is a possibility to start customizing solutions for these people on the basis of the data that can be left behind in the whole sales process. So I think there's a good chance that the tail will wag the dog in this case because you're starting from the last mile here, excluding the consumer, but you're starting from that point onwards and then modernizing and digitizing the entire upstream workflow right up to the manufacturer. And once that happens, then, you know, together with GST and everything else, you know, then we've arrived at a, at a point where, you know, everything can be decided very quickly. Data is there for everybody to use and people don't have to be given solutions which are just cut out for a certain category of, or a set, certain trade category, rather than, you know, they would be customized to the extent that individual cash flows and all of that really reflect the credit worthiness. Now that hopefully, in the long run, will help us from getting exposed to higher credit costs, because then the underwriting is hopefully going to be a lot more responsible. So I think there are short-term benefits which are very clear, 
which are the reason why the use cases come about. There are medium term benefits, but in the long term, I think we are looking at responsible lending and responsible borrowing on the back of technology in a manner that it is suited mostly on a segmentation of one. Good observation. Totally agree. Um, fully. I mean, I mean, this is something that we expect may happen, but logically, this is how most of the other categories have evolved over time. Clearly. And on this point, I mean, we've highlighted some of the benefits, some of the expectations for the future. Um, and as we're discussing the, the growth, the incredible growth of this market, um, how can providers remain competitive in, in such an exponentially um, increasing um, ecosystem? By providers, you mean the lenders? I mean, by now pay later um, providers. Okay, so I'll cover it in two parts. Um, you know, by providers, the way I see it is uh, sometime very soon, and, and there will be a you know, period when all of this will get reviewed and probably already started, is uh, how is this uh, credit being deployed and how is uh, borrower selection or what we call as you know, customer selection happening. Uh, Regulatory arbitrage is something that's been, as we covered earlier, uh, that you know is exploited in the beginning, and then uh, when the volumes start picking, then the regulator comes in and then formalizes the approach, right? Uh, so that's going to happen, and in a way, if you look at it, uh, the way you keep going ahead and doing what you're doing right now is to build and put structures around it. Uh, that starts right from the fact that. Uh, you have a proper KYC process. Um, you have a good credit model that's evolved over a period of time. Um, you've chosen customers, uh, you know, by looking at who have fared well in your pilots in the earlier phase, and then uh, you know making this available for a uh, you know larger ticket sizes and so on. Uh, from a merchant standpoint or a seller standpoint, uh, it's it's essentially. Uh, removing the credit, uh, informal credit that he used to give to, let's say, a, a retailer or a smaller merchant who's buying from him, uh, to a more formalized approach. And, uh, you know, in, in a way, it makes it uh, much easier for him to increase order values that are happening on his uh, platform. Uh, so over a period of time, this uh, will require players to adjust to it, uh, even the, you know, buyers, uh, in a way, because it becomes really a need for them. Once they start using these uh, BNPLs for their purchases, then uh, it's something that is of a habit forming in nature. Um, we've seen that happen with uh, consumers. Uh, uh, when I you know, recently picked off my you know, bank statement, I noticed uh, that it's now uh, 12 to 13 pages uh, for uh, two months put together, which earlier was uh, maybe one side or two side, uh, because I, been using UPI for payments, right? And right from 80 rupees to 200 rupees to 300 rupees. In a way, um, this is something that uh, you know will be picked off in a similar fashion. And uh, I see BNPL therefore becoming uh, more of a need uh, to the customer segments that they're focusing on. The providers therefore need to focus on their requirements and then move it forward from there. Absolutely. And we've been mentioning a couple of times a regulatory framework, or better said, a, a lacking regulatory framework. Um, so yes, let's maybe discuss the risks um, associated with buy now, pay later practices, um, both in terms of like default risks and fraud as well, because we discussed how accessible and how seamless the experience is. So um, the need for better KYC, the need, the need for a better framework to prevent risks. Both of you, whoever would like to start. Oh, sorry, I didn't quite get the... So maybe what are some of the risks? What are the risks? All right. Okay. Yes. No, I think it, it just, uh, you know, there's usually a lot of exuberance when a new category opens up. So that is the first risk, which is completely human nature and nothing to do with, you know, the product category or the consumers. So that's why, you know, I, I did mention responsible lending because uh, we have seen many a times, many accidents happening only for the fact that, uh, you know, people have not exercised caution. The second thing is also the crowding out of the market. Usually what happens in a certain category that opens up 
some narrow segments start to show good performance. And then everybody thinks that that is the place for the gold rush and everybody goes there. And that category just outlives itself and becomes the poorest category over a period of time. It's happened with many, many, many credit cycles and you know many markets have got spoiled, many categories have got spoiled only for the fact that you know there is little rationalism when people decide to go in, into those markets. So I think uh, prudence is, from, you know, is, is most important, responsible lending is most important. The second thing is that because it's all going to be data and tech led, it is obviously open to all other kinds of uh, security, IT security risks, cyber risks, like any other business which depends on digital technologies. Now, if it is going to be a full downstream sort of a, a workflow that we end up with, the risks are going to be manifold at many places because then the risk is not contained only at the user level. It's not contained only at the buyer level. If anything can be a risk. Even you know the Wi-Fi camera in the store can be a point of compromise. You know if somebody has to really play foul. So I think a very strong framework around cyber risk is equally important. The third, of course, is the regulatory side of things is evolving. We have seen change in the legislation. We've changed. We've seen change in the regulation, both more recently. Uh, it is meant to include more people and broaden the whole market and the framework and the acceptability for a new category. However, you know, there are always some bad actors who will find some loopholes here and there. And, you know, they will misuse the, the arbitrage that they might get out of regulation. And that is something that has to be watched out for. So I think the, the board becomes a very important uh, stakeholder in this whole thing, the board for all these entities who are going to be uh, entering this. And like the way we've seen in a category like uh, consumer loans, several fake apps and several fake, uh, you know, those kind of loans which were given out and all kinds of malpractices and then RBI had to step in finally. Uh, those have to be avoided up front. So we, we shouldn't be going down the path that we make the same mistakes, take the same measures, and then, you know, decide that no, we will not learn from our past mistakes. And yes, uh, I think as data starts to show and mature, and we can decide on the maturity uh, life cycle whether you know the data needs to mature over a one-year period or a five-year period. But there are going to be some very good quality early learnings. Those have to be put back into the practice so that we don't, you know, we at least keep refining those models, whether they are based on algorithms or they are based on any kind of a risk management framework. So I think some total of all this is is actually around risk management. So in, within that risk management, everything will come, including reputation risk. Thank you, Nitin. Rajiv, so how regulation would mitigate um, some of these risks we have highlighted? So we did uh, you know, talk about regulatory risk that is going to uh, be carried by some of these players. Uh, one of them, obviously, is going to be uh, how well are you completing your KYC, right? Uh, that aside, uh, what we keep hearing, and probably uh, may be true as well, that these lines are essentially not reported to the credit uh, uh, you know, uh, CICs or what you call as, you know, uh, credit information bureau. So if that doesn't happen, and, and in the earlier panel, I remember one of the participants asking what happens if, you know, you over leverage a, a, a borrower because of the freedom that you give to him or the convenience that you give to him. Uh, loan stacking is a very much possibility. Uh, today, this particular product is uh, uh, being offered to all and sundry and uh, you know, someone who's not borrowed before, it's fine until the time then uh, he doesn't over leverage himself, right? Uh, but beyond a point, that's a, a big risk. So default risk uh, continues to exist. Uh, uh, and it, it, it'll, it'll fall back even on the sellers uh, in a way uh, for of cancellation of orders or of, of not getting, uh, you know, payments for the, um, you know, merchants, uh, you know, purchases made on them. Uh, so, but ultimately what matters is, um, how this product evolves over a period of time. Today, it's it's offered as a mode of convenience, right? There is no two-factor authentication in some of the products that I see, right? And probably that's one of the pitch uh, that you don't have to enter your card number and CVV and you know OTP and all that stuff. You can just check out fast and move ahead. That also may fall back as the main reason for the risk. Uh, Nitin highlighted the cybersecurity risk around it, right? Uh, all these put together, it 
you may come to a point where you have to decide uh, how to regulate it uh, without killing the product in itself. Because very clearly, the adoption rates show that uh, it's, uh, it's something that is going to be there uh, in some form or the other, right? And probably as much as possible the way it is right now with proper regulations. Yeah, it's a, it's a thin line between regulating it and putting up some barriers that would, would kill the frictionless experience and, and yes, the benefits we've been mentioning. Um, well, to conclude, um, before we pass on to the audience for some questions, um, let's look forward. Where is the market headed? We mentioned regulation. What else? <laughs> so this this is going to stay, uh, and as I see, uh, maybe three times, four times, and some of the predictions and how they calculated, but uh, you know how to arrive at that number of fifty billion or whatever. But but it's going to stay, and I I, I see this become uh, so easy. Uh, you know, yesterday my six-year-old daughter was uh, you know asking me, hey dad, what you what are you doing? Um, and I was just going through these list of questions and, you know, preparing for it, right? So she asked me, hey, what is BNPL? And I explained to her saying that, uh, uh, so, you know, you want a chocolate in the evening, right? Uh, so I'll give you the chocolate now. But uh, you have to finish your homework one, homework two, and homework three. Uh, maybe you can do half of it now, half of it because the weekend is coming, but before Sunday night you have to finish it, okay? So that's in the definition the way I explained to her. That is a BNPL. So, I, you know, I see this being adopted and probably the age, uh, I mean, I saw in the Zest Money report that, you know, 18 years plus uh, people have started using it and there's quite a bit of adoption there, right? Uh, maybe sometime, you know, you'll see the adoption going into, you know, when the regulatory framework allows even below that. Um, so I, it's, it's there to stay. And especially it's going to pick off in the B2B segment. Right now the penetration is very low. There are very few players actually offering it, uh, but uh, starting small uh, in the Kirana uh, or a, you know someone who's doing electronic retail, it, it, it's essential for them. Nobody gives them credit. Uh, so it, it credit in the ticket sizes of limit sizes of three lakh or four lakh, there isn't anyone addressing them right now. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Nitin. Anything to add, or no, I shall we? I just think we should. We should be patient with this category. Yes, it's exploding, but like with many other businesses, take the example of cards, it's taken 15 to 20 years to mature, even with the under penetration that we have in India. So we are bound to encounter some minor accidents, but the major ones can be avoided if <clears throat> we put the right things in place and let the category evolve naturally rather than forcing it to evolve in a manner that uh, leads to uh, a situation where then people have to pull back and then we abandon that category altogether and think that, yeah, it was an experiment but didn't work for anybody. Because we will again go back to the same problem of many more people who will get left out. This is a good chance to include people. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, well, thank you both for your insights. Um, is anybody in the audience um, coming up with any questions? This is your moment, okay? There's a gentleman there, please. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my question is with respect to the difference between traditional supply chain finance product like a factoring and dealer finance with buy now, pay later in B2B segment. Okay. So today when you're doing, uh, you know, factoring or reverse factoring or supply chain finance, uh, you know, there's a component of, uh, you know, discount that is passed on in form of interest rate to the uh, you know, end borrower. If he pays upfront, he gets a cash discount, right? And that is replaced by, uh, you know, credit at this point in time. Uh, you know, there are segments, and and which is which is what is being addressed right now, where this is not available for the smaller uh, or what you call as micro customer segment, right? Uh, I was having a conversation with someone uh, recently on a product that they are offering, where, you know. Uh, you know, Kirana stores, uh, you know, buy from wholesale. Uh, and uh, for them to avail of a credit, uh, which is really non-existent. Uh, we did talk about, uh, 
they, we did talk about commercial cards, which currently is not available to them anyway. Right? Uh, for them to avail a 14-day uh, or a 30-day credit, uh, supply chain finance or you know factoring or reverse factoring doesn't exist. Uh, they don't understand this concept. What they understand is that today you buy a supply of 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees uh, so that you can retail it out at your shop and pay it back at the end of the month, which is actually the time when you probably will need the next supply. Okay, that's what they understand. So this product caters to them. And, and, and when you move up the ticket sizes, um, I think we need patience in terms of how do you underwrite them for this product. Uh, at this point in time, at a higher ticket sizes for B2B, BNPL, um, there is no model really that is perfected. Thank you. For sake of my clarity, I just wanted to elaborate this question. In certain market, especially American market, there is a concept called tier to dealer financing. You can say distributor finance. There is a concept of uh, tier to vendor finance. Probably it's happening into India only in automobile sector. So uh, can I presume that this buy now pay letter for B2B is basically filling the gap of tied to dealer finance and tied to vendor finance? Possibly. I, I mean, you uh, rightly pointed this out. Possibly it is. It is because today, even, even in these uh, tied to the smaller segments that you're talking about, uh, not everyone um, who is buying off the distributors or you know, aggregators of retailers uh, getting that credit. Some of them need to pay up front to you know, avail of the you know, supply, right? Uh, for them, that is a necessity, and uh, they need to, uh, you know, see why someone else is getting it and they're not getting it, right? So this fills that gap, and therefore, uh, maybe partially, it's actually filling that market that you're talking about. Any more questions? One in the back. Yeah. Somebody raised. Could you please raise? Your Very good evening, uh, Mr. Rajiv and Nitin and all the audience here. Uh, so I would like to draw a synergy between how the payment industry was and now, and with respect to how this industry is going forward. For example, the payment industry, if, when we talk about payment with merchants now, everyone talk about PayPTM, Google Pay, etc. Whereas, most of the bank has its own payments inside their banking application. But still, as a consumer market, in payment is dominated by private uh, technology players. Similarly, now we see the buy now pay later industries where the bank has enough capacity for the credit, whereas the, most of the lending in, the, in this segment is happening with the NBFCs. With a good undertake, uh, sorry, underwriting, with efficient, responsible banking, as well as going forward with the competition in the technology and the uh, NBFC space, how a bank should position itself here at this ju juncture, how to took, uh, take it forward? No banks, I <clears throat> see the, it's all dependent on the customer segments, right? So if the banks are catering to those customer segments, it's logical for the banks to also take the same approach. Now banks, of course, have their own apps. Banks already have a, a way of serving their customers and on those apps probably lending is offered to, in, by most banks. So this is again one of those other functionalities that, uh, you know, banks can very well introduce in the same app. I don't think this requires banks to compete on a head-on basis with fintechs. Because fintechs are doing that business and probably some other businesses as well. This, there, there would be very few only B2B, uh, BNPL fintechs. Most of the fintechs would be in other product categories as well, which is much the same as any bank would be. So I don't think uh, you know there is going to be any difference. It's just that the same technology has to be used, the same algorithms have to be built, the same ease of use has to be brought about. And therefore, when the market is addressed by different players, there is consistency in the experience that the customer gets. That would be far more important, rather than where you place this, whether in the same app or outside. Logically, yes, in the same app. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? OK. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Meeting Chuk, thank you. Deputy Managing Director and Head of Digital Banking at State Bank of India, and Rajiv Janjanam, Senior Vice President, Digital Retail, MSME, Working Capital and Digital Lending, RPL Bank. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, good evening. We're all still awake. Excellent. Uh, I'm very pleased that we've had a, a good day. Firstly, thank you all for uh, taking the effort um, and for being brave enough to show up in a in-person event. Uh, it's, uh, I'm glad to see that uh, people are stepping out and getting a chance to interact and network and be human beings again. <laughs> so it's good to see, uh, good to see you all today. Um, it's been, uh, for me personally, I hope it's been for all of you, but for me personally, it's been, uh, um, you know, generally management consultants think that they know everything. <laughs> but uh, the moment you sit through uh, conferences and sessions like this, you realize there's a lot more to learn. And I think it's been a great learning experience for me today on all the various topics that we talked about. Um, I think the, I want to make two comments. One is obviously summarize on all the positives that came through the sessions. Uh, but uh, having lived in the US for a long time and uh, having seen what excessive credit can do to a market, uh, I will maybe make a couple of comments at the end uh, on that, right? So I think the good news is out there for uh, everybody to see. Uh, you know, we've got a great regulatory runway. Uh, we have a good technology backbone in terms of communication. Uh, Indians by nature are highly innovative. And uh, clearly, uh, uh, we will continue to innovate every day uh, with new products and new solutions. Uh, we see uh, huge untapped opportunities. Uh, for traditional products like cards, but also for new products like uh, buy now, pay later. Uh, we have huge segments of the Indian market, whether they're urban or rural, um, banked, unbanked, uh, who still uh, have opportunities for the financial services institutions. Uh, but I go back to a comment that uh, somewhere in one of the sessions happened today about you know, what's the risk, right? And the one risk um, is human behavior. Um, and in the way how mature human behavior is in handling credit maturely. Um, and uh, I think that's very important to understand because while we, while clearly it's a payments and lending conference, I think in the presentation that our head of research made uh, this morning is where lending and payments comes together. And if you heard uh, Suhail from Bharat Pay, uh, as far as Bharat Pay was concerned, the payments business is a cost of acquisition <laughs> for potentially cross-selling what I understood was a lending business. So the bottom line is no matter which way you look at it, we're down to lending and we're down to credit. And uh, from that standpoint, if I go back to my starting my career in the U.S. at a young age of 25 in Chicago and living there for a long time, uh, and not only consulting in that market, but watching my American friends, uh, these are countries with loan-to-GDP ratios over 100%. Um, and the reason they get to that point is because uh, once credit is easily available, and in the current context of digital credit, where it is so easily facilitated, the likelihood of abuse of credit intentionally or, uh, or uh, by mistake, the odds are very, very high. Uh, in addition to that, there's a the risk of obviously fraud, uh, digital fraud. In early days, there was more not digital but physical. I mean, I've faced this in the US myself where my debit card and credit card will show up in my apartment in New York and, you know, one month later, <laughs> There was a $30,000 spent by, you know, a maid who would have come in and, uh, and been swiping the card because there was no OTP uh, validation on transactions, right? So I would say that, look, you know, while we have all this great opportunity, uh, it is also a slippery slope. And I, I therefore, uh, I therefore uh, would uh, suggest that uh, all stakeholders in this business uh, appreciate the, the risk that, that while you grow, uh, it also provides challenges and 
these are credit and risk challenges and that they are likely to be more than we are anticipating right now uh, and that we should need to keep that in mind yeah so i think uh, with that note you know again i would like to thank all of you here i definitely wanted to thank the panelist uh, i know nitin is here on my request also rajiv uh, uh, mehul is also here um, number of them have obviously left uh, but i i'm sure you all have enjoyed the intellect and interaction i think it's been at a really good level uh, my obviously thanks to my team uh, robin uh, for uh, for doing a fantastic job as ever gaya for running the last session ram is in the room today today and he was here in the morning running a session nikhil for his presentation and obviously the whole ibs team for having pulled this together yeah. so with that thanks once again uh, have a have a good weekend coming up and um, and enjoy the rest of the year thank you